Coming up next, I'm filling in for a vacationing Leo Laporte, and we're talking about Apple Music and Beats One. And also, Apple has a social conscience, and now they're really, really talking about it, which is kind of cool and kind of funky. All this next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. MacBreak Weekly, episode 461, recorded on Tuesday, June 30th, 2015. MacBreak One. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Wealthfront. Wealthfront is a low cost automated investment service. That is the most sophisticated way for you to invest your money. Whether you've got millions or you're just starting out, visit Wealthfront.com slash MacBreak to sign up and get your free personalized investment portfolio. That's Wealthfront.com slash MacBreak. And by LegalZoom. If you're looking to incorporate, form an LLC, get a trademark or more, LegalZoom can help you get started the right way. LegalZoom is not a law firm, but can connect you with an independent attorney. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code MBW in the referral box at checkout for your special discount. Spanning the globe with new music. Hot for today, hot for tomorrow, and for yesterday as well. It's Mac Break One. We're creating a revolution, and you're here on the ground. Okay, I can't. I can't, I can't keep that up for an hour and a half. Uh, it's time for oh. Mac Break Weekly. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'm Andy Notka of the Chicago Sun-Times, filling in for a vacationing Leo Laporte. Uh, but we got so many cool things to talk about today and so many cool people to talk about them with. With all, uh, us, as always, is Renee Ritchie of IMOR. Renee, how are you doing today? I'm doing brilliantly, Andy. I can't believe I'm on C Mac Break Weekly for once. Live oh, around the world. Back. We should get each other's together. And, and from Canada, we've got our Canadian DJ, Renee. Live from around the world. Our genre is great. Back break weekly one. We also we also have to like do uh, uh, we have to do station IDs while people are talking every about <laughs> minute and a half if, if Beats One is too. <laughs> but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, we're also very fortunate to have Christina Warren, uh, senior tech correspondent from National Mashable. Christina, how are you doing? Busy day for you too. <laughs> yes, very busy day. I spend most of the morning sleeping because I went to bed uh, uh, like after I filed my my uh, Apple embargoes this morning. So uh, no, busy day, lots of stuff. I'm uh, I'm coming to you live from New York City. Uh, no, I, I can't do the accent. Uh, Mac break, uh, Mac break one. Do we still believe Christina's? I've been interviewing Apple executives all day. I'm so tired. Bit. Are we still buying that. <laughs> That's a that's a great reason to be tired. It's more like, well, I was been watching Seinfeld on Hulu. I didn't realize it was five thirty a.m. Probably until... did both. <laughs> uh, that was over the weekend, Andy. That wasn't last night. That was like Saturday and Sunday night. Oh. Hey, I, well, I, I got the Mac. I got the Mac put in that apartment, man. Uh, that that's all I care about. <laughs> we all saved the world. We're, we're, we're all here to fight the battles we feel as though we're best qualified to fight. I, I, I had an experience like that where there was a, a high-profile product in which they used the wrong plural form in the user interface. <laughs> and I said, well, you, might wanna, you might wanna change those to this. Like, oh, wow, good catch, thank you. And then I felt like, you know what, it's 2 p.m., but I'm gonna knock off work for the day because I spoke truth to power and I affected social change. <laughs> so it's so also, with, working. also with us is Kelly Guymont of Mac Observer and App Camp for Girls. How you doing, Kelly? I'm well, Andy. How are you? Accent hanging aside. in, hanging on. It's the, <laughs> the weather's not that nice. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping for you know subarctic, uh, subarctic things going on here. Uh, no matter how many windows I open, it's just not working. I'm also, with you. I'm, it's we're having the same thing here. So, and and it's not what we do as Portlanders. It's this is not a thing. And so we've had like a week of 90 degree temperatures, and it's not okay. Yeah, see, I, I was looking at the they they, they uh, on Twitter someplace uh, they had the national map talking about a national heat wave, and uh, I'm normally very happy to live in the Northeast, but I'm also happy because the Northeast right now is the only place that's colored orange, trending towards yellow, as opposed <laughs> yes. to red. Oh, geez, trending towards a redder version of red. So, yes. Uh, well, hey, hey Andy, before we move on, I think uh, it should be noted that we now have an official logo for Mac Break One. <gasps> there you go. Uh, Very nice. So anytime we do a sounder or a bumper, we have something to jump to. That's thanks to F and Dunn. Portland, Montreal, also, Boston, New York. <laughs> <laughs> 
and as personal as your living room. It's Mac Break One. <laughs> <laughs> Also, we 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 each got a taste of today's show of the merchandising on on MB One. So I'm glad I'm glad to know that you know we're we're giving back to the community, but also hoping to put that Tesla in our driveway. Uh, but of course, today's big well, news is uh, oh, go ahead. that would look good on a T-shirt. Let's just point out. <laughs> also, it, we would fit in pretty much everywhere. It's one of those great logos that could mean just about anything. Yeah. So it could it could be like our music our own personal music group or it could mean that we have like sort of a leveraged financial holding company that managed to finish the third stage of the transaction deal or, and everyone on the team got a t-shirt or maybe it's a solution for property i don't know uh <laughs> it looks as if Jason <laughs> literally lifted the logo off the internet and we've repurposed it for MacBreak weekly so it could be a number of things it would be it would be very apple for us to say well actually we really do need that trademark we really have to launch on this date we'll set it out we'll settle it in the courts later on <laughs> we'll, see. We'll, we'll see whether the whether mb1 becomes better better well known for our brand new next generation iphone or this little property holding company somewhere that no one's ever heard of <laughs> good luck to you again i i if if i were you i'd be take i'd be accepting the six thousand dollar settlement we're offering but hey we're not, we're both businessmen i guess we're just in different businesses <laughs> Okay, so uh, yes, today was the official launch of Apple Music, including the launch of uh, of uh, of Beats One, their uh, the uh, the uh, internationally uh, 100 country uh, live radio station. Uh, those of you who were tuning in at noon on the dot and had updated to uh, iOS 8.4 on your iOS devices, this is what you got to hear. First, about three hours of Brian Eno <laughs> music, like on hold Boy, streaming man. music. A little bit of uh, microphone chatter. We spent the last three months trying to build this radio station and now we can build no more. We must launch. We've had all sorts of ideas about the first song, things that have made statements, things with fanfare. But ultimately, there's been one song that all of us keep coming back to. We've tested sound to it. I've referred it's to it lyrically man. when I needed a boost because it's been stressful at times, you know, and exciting and challenging. We've even Still cut demos to it to convince people to continue to support this radio station. This band put this EP out a few months ago with little or no fanfare outside of core fans, but they're building. That's exactly the kind of story, the kind of record we need to kick this whole thing off with. Because, man, it's not about fanfare. That's fireworks and a hangover the next day. It's about quality and consistency. We're Beats One. We're worldwide. And from now on, we're always on. And it's City by Spring King. The first song in this era right here on Apple Music. Sorry, Zane. Beats one is Spring King from Manchester, UK. City. Called it. Well, I also got <laughs> recorded it. But. Yeah, it's, so basically the next two and a half years of pub trivia questions, that has been settled. <laughs> it is going to be Spring King's City. Uh, the, now, uh, uh, Kelly, I think you're the only one who hasn't listened to uh, Beats one yet. Uh, so let's let's share our own experiences with it. Uh, Renee, what was your first impression when you first got to hear the radio station? So I don't, I have to say, I don't listen to a lot of music. I'm much more of a video person. So I have Netflix running all day instead of music running all day. And I haven't listened to music in a long time, but I put it on because I was curious. And it instantly reminded me of everything I loved about FM radio back in high school when I yeah. could name all the DJs. And it's something Christina Warren actually said to me a long time ago. We were talking on Twitter and it's like, you know, if you have the DVD on the shelf, you still don't want to, you're too lazy to go get it. So streaming is great. And it, it immediately gave me music. I didn't have to figure out what to play. I, it was just playing for me. And it was like nostalgia, all the best bits of nostalgia wrapped up in all the advantages of mobile always on connected devices. So I thought it was, I thought it was great to listen to it all morning. Yeah, I, I, I've not listened to it. It was, it felt a little bit intrusive that you occasionally hear Zane talking over parts of the music. Uh, it felt really, really weird that the first three or four songs, they would be saying like little like station IDs in the middle of the songs. But then I realized that I have not listened to FM radio. <laughs> I can't, I don't, can't even remember the, I, I think the last time I listened to radio seriously was the last time we had like a two day power outage. And that was the only way to get the like, only current thing, news right? about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Christina, what, what did you think? 
Well, so I used to listen to Zane's show on um, a BBC Radio One. Um, speaking of uh, before of trademark abuse, I wonder if Apple's going to get in trouble for calling it Beats One when it's so clearly kind of a call to to, to Radio One. Um, and in his show, you know, it was a lot kind of like what um, the Apple show seems to be. And um, I used to like basically because I don't live in the UK, you know, pirate somebody's iPlayer login to uh, to listen um, to his show. Um, so I mean, I liked it. I haven't had a ton of a chance uh, to listen to it, but it's. Um, I, I like that it's it's a weird novelty, isn't it? It's weird how like in, in a period of, you know, 15, 20 years, we've gone from radio kind of being ubiquitous and being one of the main places we get music to a live radio station being a, with people actually talking and with people actually spinning tracks and not being algorithmically determined playlists um, is, is like a novelty. And, and, and it's like, oh, my God, this is this great experience. And it's like, no, this is actually like how music was done for like, you know, 50 years. Um, so but but uh, I, I've been impressed with kind of, I guess, the the point of view, um, at least in, in the song selection so far, um, which uh I mean, I'm, I'm hearing a ton of stuff that I, I wouldn't hear maybe on anything else unless it was like a more obscure, like serious um, XM uh, channel. But um, no, I mean, so far it, it's it's cool. I don't know if it's go going to ultimately work or not, but uh, so far so good. Actually, yeah, that was I the thing that I was excited about when I heard that um, Apple had picked up Zane in the first place was because I used to also listen to his show a lot on Radio One. And I really liked um, the shows that he did. He did this series called Masterpieces where he really dug into albums and uh, they would play it and then they would have mm -hmm. like interviews and, and how like sort of the aftermath of music after this album came out. And they were things like uh, Nirvana Nevermind and Led Zeppelin IV and OK Computer and Public Enemy. Like he did a wide variety of stuff with these. And I remember getting to hear some of the early ones. And it's um, so I was really excited to hear about it. Um, and it, and it felt weird to be looking forward to something that was sort of radio related because I actively do not listen to the radio and haven't for a long time because a lot of stations here in Portland have become those robo stations where there is no DJ and there really isn't any personality and it's all being dictated by some guy in a tower somewhere else who says like, all of the stations today should be this thing, you know, um, uh, you know, everybody's going to play this song now and it's going to be popular. And I think about just in the amount of time that I've had the car that I have, um, I updated the CD player. In a, uh, I got my car, in two, the car I have now, I got in 2004. And when I got my car, I was really excited to upgrade the CD player so that it was one that would play discs that I had burned MP3s to. That was <laughs> the most exciting thing I could do with this. And one of the side options was someday when I got an iPod, I would be able to plug it in and connect it. And then once I was able to do that effectively with my phone, I basically quit burning those CDs. And that's all I use to listen to it now. Now, the aux cable that I use, I've plugged a Bluetooth receiver into the end of it. And every time I get in, my phone connects and I just move on with my day. Um, I don't do a lot of radio. So I was like, wait, they got Zane Lowe and he's going to build this radio station? That's going to be awesome. That's really weird that I think that that's going to be so awesome. So I can't <laughs> wait to see how it ultimately ends up evolving. That sounds cool. So they played a French I, song I, already. <laughs> I, I never, I've, I've never heard Zane before. So is he known for doing these like really elect, eclectic playlists? Because one of the things I really liked about my first half hour with it is that it wasn't all like music for people who have a six month window of uh, of interest in music. They had the <laughs> ACDC for those about to rock. Yeah. They had some Pharrell. They yeah. had some uh, some Beck. They had some uh, new artists that I had never heard of, but I liked a lot. Is is this like is Zane like known yeah. for like just cool yeah. music wherever it comes from. He's deep. Exactly. He's got some yeah. deep music cred. And it's and it's broad too. Like that's the thing. Is Very he, broad. Like he's got cred all the way down, but also all the way across. So um, he's sort of like John Peel in that way where John Peel really didn't care if it was a rock song or a pop song or an electronic song. He just cared that it was great. And um, Zane, is, Zane Lowe somehow has a similar sort of knack for that kind of like, this is a great song. Oh. Yeah, no, exactly. And when I talked to uh, when I talked to Trent Reznor yesterday, and, and I promise you guys, I'm not going to say that too many times, but but saying that, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> hey, no, say, say that as many times as you want, because yeah, that's if awesome. I had the if opportunity I, if, to if, say if, that. If, I would if, say if, it an awful exactly, lot. If I got an interview with Dave Grohl, it would be I would be wearing. A, <laughs> I talked to Dave Grohl hat here. And It'd a, be no, my first tattoo. Totally talk to him.
Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 no, but when I, when I talked to Trent yesterday, because um, a Beats one was, well, a lot of it was his idea. He said that, I mean, a lot of the Genesis came from hearing Zayn's show in the UK. And and when he was uh, going back and forth uh, to London to, to complete his, his last album, he um, would, would listen to uh, Radio One a lot in Zayn's show. And so when they started kind of playing around with the idea of doing a radio station, he said that the first and only choice was Zayn. So they approached him and basically said, we want you to take, have full control, put your DNA, put your judgment, put everything into kind of the, 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 you know, essence of this station. Um, so, um, yeah, he's really well known for having a good, uh, and a unique voice and, and not being the typical kind of, um, uh, DJ. And I think that what's interesting about that is because this is a, a an international uh, radio station, which in and of itself is actually kind of unique in this day and age. Um, there are so many people who who haven't been exposed to him. Like Kelly and I, we we've listened to him and we like went through like weird ways to try to like listen to him. But like a lot of people in America have never been exposed to him, and maybe people in other parts of the world haven't. And I think that's uh, that's interesting that that they're able to do that. And I think that's one of the the things that uh, probably only Apple can do because of just their their broad scale and the fact that they have so much money that they can you know invest in experiments like this to see if something like this is going to work. I can't see other companies bothering. Um, to create a, a live, you know, uh, 24 hour international radio station. That was a huge thing for me. It's because, uh, you know, it's not going to make as much money as all of Apple music is not going to make as much money as the iPhone, not even the iPad, probably not even in the Apple TV for them in the long scale of things. But they're willing to, they, they literally do love music so much that they put it at the very top of apple.com. They've got everyone at iTunes all the way to the highest levels, deeply invested in this, throwing resources at it. And they, they believe they don't, Apple doesn't need this. Apple could lose music and not, you know, it would, it would not be a very big hit on their bottom line, but they really believe that they need music to be part of their DNA and that they haven't, they haven't had music since the height of the iPod, and this is their big shot to get it back. And I think it's wonderfully human and optimistic. And whether it wins or loses, it, it, at the very least, people on Twitter are having a worldwide conversation about music <laughs> and a shared experience now, which is amazing. Yeah, I mean, I had a, uh, I, I think all a lot of us were a little bit puzzled by what Apple Music was going to be uh, during the during the keynote because I don't think they made a really good comment on what, what they're going to be doing that was different. Uh, and uh, and a, a unique position that Apple is in is that they're, unlike Spotify, unlike RDO, they don't have to make a fortune off of music uh, and off of a streaming service. They just have to make it sure that it does okay, because like with Google Music, it's just part of a larger portfolio. Uh, and so it's really, really encouraging to see that they didn't just simply say, well, yeah, okay, fine, we'll have a streaming internet station too. We'll just hire some consultants to put together a playlist that will just loop for 24 hours. Uh, Christine, did, uh, did Trent Reznor have anything else to say about how the what the intent of the radio station was going to be because it, it I, I was impressed that someone who was so deeply ingrained with music got so much power to simply shape here's what the content is going to be like it just didn't yeah, sound no, very I corporate mean, decision no no not at all well so i mean a lot of this comes back from the you know from really goes back to, to beats music and and what beats music was trying to be and so you know it, i think it shows a couple of things one it shows that when apple acquired beats and, and and obviously beats music um they've done a really good job and, and and i've seen this kind of internally from the people i've known who've gone from one place to the other of um i guess keeping the beats culture intact and so um i think that some of the ideas that that the trent had were things he wanted to do at beats and then he felt like okay at apple i'll actually have the opportunity and the scale and the money to to, to get this done um but he actually made a comment it was kind of interesting we're talking about how renee was mentioning that we're having this like kind of global conversation about a radio station right now and that's kind of what their intention is they kind of wanted to have a throwback when i when i talked to somebody um from from apple music um at wwdc he kind of likened it to you know remember when when mtv was new and it was the sort of thing where everybody had kind of a conversation about what was happening on mtv and they kind of want to create something that has i think trent reznor said if i have to look at my notes something like like you know have like a a cultural, you know, uh, resonance, like, like, like be like culturally relevant. And, um, that's, I, I, you know, I think a big part of about what they want the product to be. And I think part of the reason that they're investing in this is, and I talked to, to Eddie about this and, and, and Jimmy Iovine too, um, is that they firmly believe that the only way that this really works is, um, and, and can make money for everybody. The only way it scales, you know, Jimmy Iovine said is that if it's um, a service and not a utility, and he sees the existing streaming services, not as services, but as utilities where, you know, th basically they haven't taken any kind of, you know, um, curated artistic 
approach, editorialized approach to the music. They just kind of dump you in. Maybe they have some some playlists. Maybe they have some, you know, um, you know, curators and that sort of thing. But they're not really taking um, a, a really handpicked kind of, you know, deep dive level into creating a great music experience. Um, and so if this is going to work, if people are going to pay, the experience has to be key. And they think that the way that you do that is by doing things like having you know, the place that you can listen to live radio anywhere in the world, the fact that they're going to be doing it 24 seven, the fact that they will have artists doing unique types of shows. So even though Zane's show will be accessible to the mainstream, there will be an hour programming each night that might be like out of the mainstream where you might have like, you know, once a week, you know, like, like St. Vincent, she'll have a show where she's going to be kind of creating a custom mixtape for, for people based on um, their requests and the, and the letters that they send her. And uh, so, so I, I kind of described that, uh, to the beats guys or the Apple guys, I was like, Oh, so you like Delilah that doesn't suck. Um, and, and I think that that's, uh, what their, it, it came to cross to me anyway, like this is a core part of their mission is, is to really have a good solid music experience because that's what will keep people, um, in it. And that's what will make people subscribe and ultimately pay for it. Um, is that they can get something out of it that isn't just, you know, dumping them into, a catalog of, of music with a search bar. And how many Zane Lowe's are available to run your curated music <laughs> radio station? Right. Yeah. It's a valid question. And it's really not that many. I, what's really been interesting to me in, in a lot of this is watching how Trent Reznor's role in the music world has evolved from, let's just paint in some broad strokes, from Pretty Hate Machine to now. Like mm -hmm. that's a pretty, that that's a pretty wide and, and and winding path that he's taken. And it's been really interesting to watch. Um, we were talking about him in the chat room. And like he had a streaming radio station ages ago, if I'm if I'm remembering properly. And I, I feel like I am because I was only interested because it was Trent Reznor. Um, and he did like an internet radio station a long time ago where it was like his handpicked stuff out of yeah. his record collection. And, and that kind of stuff is always really great. And I never really got into the celebrity playlists. And so I'm hoping on iTunes. So I'm hoping that with the connect stuff that they're doing, that maybe that will be a little nicer. But of course, all of that leads to a conversation about how Apple wants me to spend more time in iTunes when all I want in life is to feed it to a wood chipper. So <laughs> <laughs> there's some tension there right now in that relationship. How big do, you th do we think that Connect is going to be to the experience? We, we've already had some artists that are posting like full studio ver uh, uh, tracks without audio. We've had uh, mm -hmm. lost tracks being posted. Um, my point of confusion about Connect is whether it's going to be more like SoundCloud where anybody can come in and post their uh, their own creations or whether it's going to be more like a marketing thing where if there's someone who's selling a lot of stuff through iTunes, they can use Connect tracks and Connect right. bonus materials to encourage people to buy what, what vibe are, are, is anybody else getting from this? I think they want it to be a mix of both. So when I talked to to Ian Rogers, who was the CEO of Beats Music and now kind of runs like the iTunes radio stuff and is, is heavily involved with, with Apple Music, he basically kind of described Connect as kind of their vision of wanting to kind of take what you saw on SoundCloud and bring it um, to, you know, uh, to iTunes. So you wouldn't have to go to a bunch of other apps. Um, and, and they've been very clear, you know, right. There was an update to the garage band that was issued today where you can actually publish directly from garage band to, uh, connect and, and the artists have complete control over whether they want, um, you know, the, the music to be pay, you know, behind the paywall or not, um, how accessible they want it to be. It can be, you know, their own track. It can be brand new. It doesn't have to be associated with anything else. Like you said, you know, Trent, he released, you know, the with teeth album, um, without vocals, um, I, in Ward, um, he posted some track yesterday. I saw that, you know, it was like some, um, live, uh, track from, from a KCRW performance from a couple of years ago. Um, I mean, I think that the idea is that they want artists to be able to use it that way. I think the reality is, I don't know how they're able to maybe internally scale it so that more artists can have access. I don't know what that process is going to be of getting people to access it. Cause part of what makes SoundCloud so great is that anybody can use it. And, and that means that there's like a lot of crap and stuff that you don't want to see, but that also means there are a lot of up and coming emerging artists who might not have the label representation who are on SoundCloud and kind of build a following that way. So I don't know how you're able to, I guess, do that SoundCloudy thing in a vetted way, which is I'm sure what Apple wants. Um, my fear with connect, I think it's a cool idea. And I think that, um, if, if, 
you know, people use it, if the artists use it, it has the potential to be a really cool tool. I just, having talked to the artists for so many years and, and seeing how much they've struggled to get the social game and get the digital game when it comes to music, you know, they all got MySpace. And then it was like when MySpace died, nobody knew what to do. And they've kind of, you know, scattered to these various platforms. I don't know if this is going to be the answer, bro. this is going to be the service they use to, to connect with fans. I, I, I almost think that they'll still continue to use SoundCloud and Twitter and Facebook and, and, you know, Instagram and, and other places. Um, and so it might just, it, I think it runs the risk of becoming just another marketing platform. And if that's what it is, where you're basically just seeing the same stuff that you would see if you follow them on on, on Instagram or, or, or YouTube or wherever, um, I don't know if it's actually going to have any value. And I don't know if users are actually going to engage with it because at that point, it's basically just ping and we know what happened <laughs> to ping. <laughs> I think some people were also yeah. unclear because I think they said that you could go from Connect and share stuff out, but some people were assuming that all the Facebook and Twitter stuff would also come in and it just seemed like no one really knew what it was going to be yet. Right. You can share out, but it's not going to pull in the other stuff. Yeah. So if you wanted to actually post, you'd have to you'd have to post to, to multiple places at the same time, which, you know, frankly, plenty, plenty of musicians, they have their people, you know, if they have a team to do that. You know, it's not like they're all individually posting to Google Plus every time they update something. They they have they're they're purposely having someone, you know, make that decision to publish there too. So um I think that'll be be the big thing though is we'll see if they just start to to, to share the same content that they're sharing other places or if they actually want to make it a, a destination for for original content. Yeah. And I think Apple actually kind of, kind of has a responsibility to make a service like Connect part of this because intentionally or not to various degrees, if the goal is to make sure that people are never going to leave an Apple app in order to get music the way that they want to get it, it makes people less likely to leave the, the, uh, the music app uh, to get outside music. So it seems as though it's they almost have an obligation to make sure that people who are not necessarily the holders of really huge uh, studio deals have the ability to at least place music in a place where uh, Apple and uh, iPhone users are going to be able to see it. Uh, do you, uh, is, is, is it really in their best long term interest, though, to support something like Connect, though? Renee, t t tell me about that. I was sort of really interested, and I know I know iTunes is horrible, and there's all sorts of legacy and and portability reasons. We hope this proves to be self-evident. Yeah. So <laughs> that being said, uh, I think when Jimmy Ivine said that they were trying to make one single thought around music, he was being sincere. And I think a lot of times when Apple speaks, they are really sincere about that. And people have complained that it's it's complicated. The new music app is complicated. I'm sure music in iTunes is going to be even more complicated. But they have this advantage of being able to put this app on the screen of hundreds of millions of devices all at once. And right now we do have a very fragmented experience. Some of us have iTunes music, some of us have Google music, some of us have Spotify subscriptions or Audio or Pandora or Slacker and on and on and on. And you're always jumping around. And for me, it's almost like, not quite, but it's almost like that experience of going to iOS 8 where everything I used to hunt around and peck and choose for is suddenly just available to me in one place. And it does cause a little bit of friction and there will be limitations and collisions and things that aren't intuitive at first. But the ability to have all these different types of music from what I've bought in my collection to what I can stream from the iTunes collection to what Zane Lowe and the rest are, are DJing on Beats Radio to everything that's in Connect all in one place. And with the mini player, it's really easy to control that and move around and do a lot of things. It almost becomes its own little environment. And that makes it incredibly powerful to me. It's it's almost that old Apple adage of we have that, you know, that one, that one shot and it has to be the Babe Ruth shot. They're putting all their wood behind it being this one seamless experience. And if part of that is broken, maybe it won't work. So it's like a gamble. But I think certainly compared to what we've seen from other people, it's it's worth a shot from them at this point. Yeah, I, I well, really feel like this is. I really feel like this is the first time that they have taken a passion approach to music since they realized that the Motorola Rocker was a bad idea and they had to take music <laughs> yeah. into their own hands. I mean, it's <laughs> nice to see that they're not just simply they just toss this project to somewhere because we need one of those as well. And that's definitely the uh, the the approach I get. I'm sorry, I was interrupting though. Uh, uh, Kelly, was that you? Yeah, it was. I just wanted to say that um, at least on the upside, they're giving it away right now. So it's not yeah. like you're paying for something from the get-go. And if there are rough edges, you know, um, people have, as, as in fact, iTunes itself has taught us, um, anything that wants any amount of money from you for any reason must be absolute perfection or it's <laughs> utter crap. There is no middle ground, according to the reviews in the iTunes store. So um, I, I really like that they're giving it away for free and it sort of feels like... Um, Maybe it's maybe it's a little bit beta 
And yeah. there may be some there may be some some rough spots. Like once I update my phone and I'm able to start using it, it might end up being a little odd. But at the same time, if it's free, I'm not going to worry about it too much. And I'm willing to cut them an awful lot of slack as long as they're not charging me for anything. So um, if it turns out to be something really well, this would be the one that I would pay for. Um, I actually don't pay for a streaming service now. I am apparently not the young people who uh, don't, don't buy CDs. So I do. I, I, keep, I, 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 will, I, keep, I keep finding out like people are like, you know, I'm really excited about this new thing that came out and I went and bought it and people what like not in mm-hmm. itunes like yeah, yeah. Like, I basically, CDs. <laughs> <laughs> well and it you know i i love cds i love the import version i love um opening up the little booklet and reading all the stuff that's in it um i was actually a little bit sad when everything went to cds i do remember records and the books were a lot bigger and you could get a lot more cool yeah. stuff in them um so to me like looking at something like Spotify, which I don't have ultimate control over my playlist, um, you know, at least for free, uh, you know, to me, that doesn't hold a lot of appeal and Pandora never really held a lot of appeal. And it's only in the iTunes radio stations that have uh, ended up over time being very well trained. um, Thanks to the fact that I actually can do that on any device that I'm using. Uh, That has been, uh, probably the best listening experience I've had, but I still am not paying for any of them. So if this one was actually, um, actually turns out to be something really useful and, and very interesting, this is the thing I would listen to in the car. And, you know, maybe even not my own playlist, just put on whatever's on Beats 1 at the time and see what the radio, air quote radio, has uh, for me when I'm headed someplace. Yeah. yeah, that was what Eddie said to me, um, you know, talking about how like, I, I, and, I, and I wrote about this a little bit in my piece. I don't think that their goal right now anyway is to like steal away the people that are already subscribing to RDO or Spotify or, or whatever. I think that they're really kind of going after the much bigger audience who doesn't pay for anything at all. And and I and I agree with you, Kelly. I think that having a free trial, you know, three months free gives them a lot of, of, of room to do that. It, it does two things. One, you know, it lets them work out, you know, the kinks. And, and I think the underlying product is really solid, but I think that obviously there are going to be issues with, you know, and the syncing stuff and some of the cloud stuff. And, and obviously they'll need to get the, the radio and some of the other features, you know, um, uh, working correctly. But um, so so doing that while, you know, the product is, is free, I think um, gives them a, a lot of goodwill that they wouldn't have if they launched it fully formed um, or, or rather charging fully and, and it didn't feel fully formed. But, but I also think that, you know, like, I, I, I get the distinct feeling that they are trying to do exactly what you're saying, Kelly. They're trying to go after people who haven't really had a reason to pay for music. Like I have had, let's see, I had a streaming music subscription service, I think before iTunes even was on Windows. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm thinking correctly, I had a, a, a Rhapsody account, I think it was even before Real Botham in, in 2002 or 2003. And that was before the iTunes store even hit Windows. And um, that was like $10 a month. And it had, you know, I think maybe like a, like a, you know, three or 400,000 song library. And then it eventually got, got bigger and bigger. Um, I, I've been a Spotify subscriber since, gosh, um, they came to the US in 2011, but I, I've been with them, I think since 2000 nine or something. Um, thanks, um, um, of Spotify Sweden guys. Um, and, um, I, I, have dabbled with RDO and, and, and the other services too. I even remember the beats music precursor, which was Mog. Um, and so I'm the weird person that pays for these services and that always has. And, and then I still buy music too, but I, I, I buy everything. I'm like a, a, a media hoarder and, and whore. And, and I just, I buy too much, um, digital stuff, um, and, and physical stuff for that matter. But, um, I think for the people who aren't like me, the majority, this is kind of what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, okay, um, we can give you an experience that will make it easy for you to listen to anything you want, have access to all the things you've purchased before. And then we're also going to help you discover new music and give you kind of a lean back, a lean listen um, experience. And um, that I think that their target audience there is a lot larger than the, you know, 20 million people that pay for Spotify, um, which, which is great. But I feel like, I mean, Eddie said he didn't, he didn't use these terms exactly, but his term was basically like, you know, look, we, we can, you know, still do really well. You know, we don't have to, we don't have to, to steal from them for us to still win, you know, kind of, kind of a play on, you know, Steve Jobs is, you know, like Apple, you know, for, for Apple to win, Microsoft doesn't have to lose. Um, and, and so I think that there's, it's, there's a broad enough uh, sector of people who just don't pay at all that they can, they can capture some of that they can capture, you know, a significant portion or even a small portion of that audience. Um, they have a real shot and, and uh, eventually what might happen is some people might, 
you know, migrate over from, from Spotify or audio or whatever. And some people might not for, for me, what I anticipate happening is that I will be paying for Apple music and I will be paying for Spotify side by side for a long time until I can figure out if I can get rid of Spotify. Um, but I do very much anticipate paying for Apple music just because I like the experience of having the last 12 years of my purchases living alongside, you know, my, my streaming a la carte stuff. Like for me, that's, yeah. that's worth the $10 a month. I'm really glad to see that Apple has not, oftentimes when Apple introduces a new product or service, be it Siri or Apple News, part of it is to make the iPhone or make something that they sell that much more valuable and give make that a value add that's exclusive to uh, to iOS or to macOS. Uh, and Apple Music is certainly the most ecumenical product that Apple is making. Uh, because at least by until the end of the at the end of the year when everything is all uh, all said and done, you will be able to get access to Apple Music on Mac, on iOS, on Windows. Uh, an Android app is coming uh, in a few months, uh, and so my usual worry is about liking Beats One so much that I feel as though I'm going to have to buy something I don't want to buy just to get this one product that I really, really like and have to do with uh, one or the other. Uh, when <laughs> Apple is simply saying, no, no, we'll, we, we, we don't approve of the fact that you carry an Android phone, but we will not punish you for carrying an Android phone. Uh, and that, that really does point to how important this service is to Apple. If, they, if all they were trying to do was to get into the music game and to make the iPhone more valuable, they certainly wouldn't be quite that open. Um, I think we do want to talk about, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I want to I ask Renee, what, uh, Christine gave a good uh, discussion about what, what it would take for her to uh, become a for real subscriber. I, I've been thinking about that myself, the difference between being a journalist subscriber, meaning I, I will pay $10 a month just so that I can continue to, to write about, uh, about Apple Music. Uh, the... Uh, Beats One really made a good impression. I've just started to dive into the iOS app. We'll talk, we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, iOS apps uh, in a bit, uh, and I'm always I'm already grateful for features that I've been begging for uh, for for several <laughs> years. So I actually do think that I might become a regular subscriber uh, in three months' time, or at the very least, I will not. I, I've set a reminder to remind mm -hmm. me to cancel in three months if I don't want to actually keep on going. And that might not just be a, I forgot to do it. It might be an actual active 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 will to do. Uh, Renee, what, what what do you think? Where are you, where are you right now? Well, just first, and you can go in, to, if you click the little account tab, you can go in and turn off auto uh, renewal if you don't want it to automatically switch to the paid account. Um, so you don't have to set the reminder. You can do it immediately and, and get it off yourself. Uh, but for me, it's actually really interesting because, I, like I said, I, I don't have a big music listener. I listen to music when I'm in the car sometimes when it's on in, in other establishments, like at a coffee shop or something. But I don't go out of my way to listen to music because I'm typically watching some sort of video somewhere. But I like the idea that it's integrated and I like the idea that it's easy. And those are the two huge wins for me. Uh, this happens to me with, with video, too, is that phenomenon where you're trying to find something to watch and you have this DVD collection or you have this or you have the Netflix queue and you just look at it and and you're paralyzed sort of you don't I don't want to watch this that's boring I just saw this but then you flip on cable TV and a movie is playing and it's got ads exactly. and it's poor it's pan and scan but you just watch it because it's on and you don't have to decide and I got that immediate feeling from Apple Music that I can find almost anything I want if I hear a snippet and want to hear it but there's also just this ambient music always playing and this really engaging personality which to me I, I found missing in a lot of the other services there was just nothing human to connect to, no, no pun intended. And for me, whether that ends up being worth $10 a month, I don't know. I'm not sure how much I'll listen to it. But if they can provide me with sort of music on demand, not just music I want to listen to, but music I never knew I wanted to listen to, and it's always available and interesting and engaging and has that sort of humanity about it, then I might easily pay the $10. Yeah. Well, again, if, 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 it, if it breaks people's habits... Again, I'm not a radio listener. I'm not even necessarily a streaming music listener. My entertainment from music comes from, I have fun uh, sitting, sitting like, you know, cross-legged on the sofa with all my CDs around me and building a playlist and making the perfect top 10 playlist. Uh, and that's where all my fun comes. So if it changes people's habits to make them into a radio listener, that's a, a pretty big win. Oh, uh, plus, uh, Andy, before, um, just before we move on, there's a bunch of people asking this. So a lot of people are getting an iCloud music library error when they're starting off. That's kind of the new name for iTunes Match. And if you're getting that, just go to settings and keep toggling it and it'll eventually work. And if you're seeing weird things that say fuse dot something string, blah, 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 Fuse is just the code name for Apple Music, and it means there's some sort of error in your localization, and you can ignore that. They will tidy that. The little L's will tidy that up as you're sleeping. <laughs> so those are the big two well, we, questions, and they're pretty easy to solve. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there are going to be some growing pains, and we haven't even talked about the Apple Music app itself and what, what it's like to integrate with your own library. Uh, uh, Christina, you had a really great article that uh, on a good walkthrough of what all that experience was like. 
Uh, my my own first impressions were really I, I I really just I'm just a dog who just wants a cookie, and I wanted <laughs> I, really it's just like I I'm happy that by they zero gave joke. Me no, exactly. It's like I'm just so happy that they gave me the ability to like do like a little on the spot cue of what's going to be up next, what I, what I want to hear next. I'm glad they finally gave me a mini player and I'm glad they finally fixed search. And apart from that, I think you give me two bacon treats and I'm good. Uh, yeah. Christina, what, 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 how easy is it going to be going to be for people after they install the 8.4 update and take off from there, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think it's easy. I mean, I think that the the thing that the for you section, which is how it kind of customizes what it will show you for your for your recommendations, they 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 took directly from from Beats Music, and it's a really fun way of kind of customizing what types of music you like. You know, you tap on bubbles, and and the, the more you tap on one thing, you know, the the the, um, the bigger the bubble gets, and um, it'll it'll sort of populate suggestions based on um, that, also your listening history, and frankly, what's in your iTunes library. And this is where having a really big iTunes library and having used a service for a long, long time really comes in handy because when I opened up Apple Music for the first time, the For You section, I was given, you know, Taylor Swift and Stefan Stevens and, um, you know, Vampire Weekend and and Dapper Cutie and like, you know, and, and Miguel and like, uh, you know, uh, the kinks, music that I love, but that I probably wouldn't see in a, a more, I guess, typical streaming service. But it knows that I like all those things because it knows that I've had that music or, or music like that in my library. Um, my music section is, you know, where all of your current songs exist. So if you are, uh, you know, all of your current purchases, and if you're an iTunes Match subscriber, all of your matched songs live there. Uh, one clarification for people who have been asking, if you already subscribe to iTunes Match, you can cancel your iTunes Match subscription if you want to subscribe to Apple Music. The services are complementary. They're very similar, but they're not the same. What that means is that how iTunes Match works is that if you cancel iTunes Match, all that matched content still exists in the cloud and you can still kind of access it. You just can't add new stuff. With Apple Music, if you stop subscribing to Apple Music, anything you've matched and have uploaded and that it's, you know, created like the, the high quality versions against, that will go away if you're not also, you know, paying for, for Apple Music. So conceivably you could pay for Apple Music and iTunes Match, but most people, if you're an iTunes Match user and you like Apple Music, you can just save the 25 bucks a year and just, uh, just get rid of that um, when your renewal point comes up. Um, but, you know, it shows you your library and it shows all of your, you know, uh, artists and, and albums that are there as well as your playlists. But uh, what, what we were saying before, what I love, uh, oh, and they fix search, like you like you mentioned, search is finally fixed. And there's a mini player um, is that your life. Exactly. It's great. Um, <laughs> is that your library now consists of both your local and your purchase files, as well as anything you've added from their catalog. So it all sits together in one place and there's not really a differentiation. It's like, it, you know, whether I, I bought an album or I uploaded it, or I've added it from Apple Music, it's in my library regardless. Um, and, and that uh, takes away uh, one of the biggest pain points that I think most streaming services have, Google Music being one of the exceptions. Uh, but obviously, if you're in the Apple ecosystem, we haven't had the opportunity to have all of your music live in one place. Um, and so that makes it really handy. And what also so cool about that is you can create playlists with songs from, from either place. And um, what's cool about that is that if you have a song that's only available, you know, that, that you bought or that you uploaded, it can sit alongside, you know, songs that you didn't purchase but are part of Apple Music. And you can still share that playlist with someone. Um, if they have the track, they can listen to it. If not, you know, it, it just will show up great out. Um, but, you know, putting all the music in one place is really cool. Uh, but, but for me, the real, like, heart and soul of the experience is that for you section, which the more you use it, the better it gets. And even just using it over the course of, you know, like, you know, 24 hours, um, I've seen it get better with its recommendations and with the stuff that it's showing to me. You know, like I'm just saying refresh on it now and it's showing me, you know, behind the boards with with, with Dallas Austin, um, who's who's an Atlanta um, uh, hip hop producer who's done stuff for, you know, back in the day, TLC and Madonna. Um, I haven't thought about Dallas Austin in years, but um, actually um, being from Atlanta, I like that sort of thing. Um, there's an intro to Kanye West uh, playlist. Um, I've got um, some stuff where like it, where it's giving me recommended albums. I'm getting Pavement, Tupac, The Shins, Keen, The White Stripes, and Nas. And that's perfect for the source of music that I like to listen to. And I and and you know, I, I haven't listened to Illumatic in a long time. Um, but it's right there and I can press tap and, and press play. 
Uh, the new feature, which is which is right next to For You, is basically where Apple, like if For You is all about giving you customized um, a, a look at what you should be listening to and, and maybe uncovering music that you might like. New is all about kind of Apple's editorial vision of, of their music experts saying, this is the new stuff and this is stuff that you should pay attention to. So it has both the new releases of the week, hot tracks, recent releases, top songs. Um, but it also, um, you know, you, you kind of can go into their, their music editors pick where they have different music editors who will curate and, you know, entire genres. So if you go into the, the um, classic rock section. Um, you can see the different playlists that the classic rock uh, curator has created. But right now, for instance, they've got albums you need to hear, which includes, you know, the Monsanto years from, from Neil Young um, and um, uh, Promise of the uh, uh, Real. Uh, it's got, you know, the Rolling Stones, ACDC. Um, they've got a whole section on uh, a spotlight on the Grateful Dead to kind of, you know, commemorate that the, the, the 50th anniversary of the band and, and their, their final concerts. And um, so you can get really deep into that sort of stuff. And um, they've got that for all these different genres. And then they're also showing like, uh, I guess like playlists for activities, which is similar to what Songza does. If I'm being honest, I think Songza still is better. But um, in terms of, you know, like playlists, you know, for like your morning jog or, you know, playlists for up in the morning and that sort of thing. And then they have, um, you know, curators, uh, you know, uh, music outlets like Rolling Stone and, and Pitchfork um, who are creating playlists uh, of music that, that people think you should hear. Um, and, and then there's the radio tab, which we've talked a lot about. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, for, for me, I, mean, I, I like recommendations, but for me, uh, just the basic usability of the player has always been just so sorely wanting. Yes. Um, it's it's one of the things that has made me a happy Android uh, phone user, the fact that there's such a, such a vibrant category of music player apps. Just, just the simple fact that this, uh, the, the new 8.4 version of, uh, of the uh, iOS music player makes it very, very easy to tell at a glance that here is a file that is, here's a music file that's on the device yes. itself and does not require an internet connection to play versus mm -hmm. how many times have I left the house like with a playlist I, I think I'm going to be listening to when I take my right. walk and then, nope, sorry, 18 of these 23 tracks are actually in the cloud. Sorry, I guess we should have told you that before you were, before you left the house. I mean, no, I'm, I'm just... Totally. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, oh, I don't know. Just breaking news, Andy. Uh, Ian has announced that that they've handed off to Julia Nuga live from London. <laughs> yes, it's like it's like following the Olympic torch. It's like it's like following the Olympic torch around the planet. We are, we are going like time zone to time zone to time zone. And actually, now that uh, you, we we laugh, but that actually makes that actually makes me wonder if you're going to be if, if if you like one DJ but not necessarily another. Like if you're a big fan of Zane Lowe, but you don't know two of these other people, and maybe they don't, you don't like their taste in music. Does that mean that this uh, that this service only lasts for like three hours a day for you? Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, that's so, basically yeah. what it means. <laughs> Do we know if there's going to be any replays? Uh, like I know they're playing the same songs again, but is it actually going to be people um, 24 hours a day, where they're going to be replays of the shows? They will do some content. Some of the content will be reused over the weekends, from what I understand. And they'll be doing some of the interview sections and other things. So some segments like this. Eminem, has like, Christina, if I miss Eminem, right, well, there's going to be hell to pay. <laughs> <laughs> well, like like they'll be replaying that Eminem, um, you know, like like interview at other times. They'll be able to repurpose that. But no, it's live. I mean, um, uh, when when I talked to them at WWDC, they said that the playlist they might make playlists available of what sets were on for a certain day, but you would miss any of the live stuff that happens. So I mean, they're kind of treating this like a live show, you know. I mean, and and kind of you know similar to just, um, you know the the KCRWs and and um, uh, KEXPs of the world, I guess, where you know like if, if you miss it, you miss it. Um, and and you know um, KCRW and some of those stations have done a good job of creating podcasts of the live experience. Um, from what I understand, Apple is not interested in doing that. I would be interested to see if maybe down the line that changes. I think right now they're really trying to build the appeal and the novelty of, of people tuning in live. Yeah, they, they also have a presence on Tumblr. They have a presence uh, outside of this service in a lot of different places where you can experience it. We do, need, we do need to go to a break, but a couple of last things about uh, uh, Apple Music before we go. Uh, we didn't mention that one of the cool things about Beats 1 is that you like a song, uh, go inside the app and simply add it to your collection. And if you're yes. a subscriber, you've got it in your collection. Uh, mm -hmm. They have some exclusives now. Uh, Pharrell Williams broke a new track. Interestingly enough, you could not add that track to your collection as it was playing. So maybe there's some some are in that in that uh, house and some are not. Uh, you cannot add uh, uh, Beatles tracks as part of this. Apparently, uh, it's uh, still uh, sold to the store. You can still get through iCloud Match, but you your subscription apparently d does not include access to the Beatles catalog. Uh, that uh, according but to ACDC and Dre, Andy. 
Well, it yeah, got, I was going to oh, say the chronic got is the there. AC, you got Finally. the DC. Uh, also, also, uh, the 1989 album, also part of the part of the collection. So we managed to solve that crisis uh, nice and quickly. Um, Our long uh, national Ray, nightmare is over. <laughs> do not. Do not pull the tail of that particular dragon. She is light. <laughs> she is talented. She is entertaining, but she is also quite, quite powerful. Um, one question that still hasn't been answered. Um, Renee, do you have any news about uh, whether Sonos is going to be working with this new system? I've heard conflicting they, information. One, they, one including well, licensing agreements. Sonos Marketing said that they would have it by the end of the year. And Ian Rogers said that it would be there ASAP, which is pretty much when I think everyone expected it to be there because it can't be there sooner than it could possibly be there. So, yeah, we just have to mm -hmm. wait and hold. And, um, yeah, I mean, Sonos is interesting. There was this whole thing about they don't support AirPlay and then maybe they don't have multi-room rights. And all this stuff is just so unbelievably hard to negotiate, especially mm -hmm. internationally, that I don't even want to think about having a job that's anything like theirs. But uh, hopefully we'll get it sooner rather than later. Yeah, the air, air, airplay. We we talk about uh, we we talk about technical limitations, but oftentimes the reason why there isn't a feature on a device that makes absolute uh, ironclad sense is because somewhere there is some line in some deal that says you are not allowed to do something that's called that that amounts to rebroadcasting or allows the same content to be broadcast. And then to Dave several Nathan explains it to time. me very patiently. Yep, and that's <laughs> and that's how that works. So uh, we will be right back with uh, after this message. We've got uh, Renee Ritchie, of course. We've got Christina Warren from Mashable, and we have got Kelly Guymont. Uh, we have a, a murderous row of uh, of commentators. Uh, <laughs> when we come back, we'll be talking about Apple's social consciousness, consciousness, uh, and their uh, desire of late to uh, make sure they flex those muscles. But after the, after this message from our vacation in Leo Laporte, I am really thrilled to welcome. Uh, this new advertiser to Mac Break Weekly, but I have... Oh, hi, Leo here. I'm just jumping in. <laughs> you, I hope you don't mind. Um, I, have, I have to say one thing about this. Normally when we do a, an advertiser on the show, it's because I use them and recommend them. I don't use Wealthfront. I can't. I want to use Wealthfront. I'm dying to use Wealthfront, but security regulations prevent me because... Companies that do what Wealthfront does, which is invest your money to make you money, are not allowed to use client testimonials. And this would be considered a client testimonial. So I, I was so ready to sign up for this. And they said, well, Leo, you can't because then it would be a client testimonial. Uh, but let me tell you about Wealthfront because this is something you ought to know about. And I've done a lot of reading over time. Uh, about investing, about the best ways to invest. I've read some really powerful books that have highly influenced uh, my investment uh, theory and policy. And it, this is particularly important when you're investing for the long haul, for your retirement, uh, for the long-term investment. And for years, I've been, you know, trying to do this, sometimes better, sometimes not. Uh, you know, index funds, very carefully managing the amount of money that's spent to manage it, even doing some uh, selling and buying for tax benefit. And then I found out about Wealthfront, and they do this all automatically. They do it beautifully, and they do it for the lowest fee I've ever seen. You know, traditional advisors, human advisors, these guys are not human. I'll explain what I mean in a second. Traditional advisors charge giant fees. I mean, we're talking 1%, 2%, as much as 3% of the money you have under management if you go to somebody to manage your money. And then there's also, that's just what they charge you. There's hidden fees and charges for the transactions uh, and changes and so forth. Wealthfront makes it so easy for you, for me, for anyone to access world-class, I mean, the kind of long-term investment management the big guys have, the millionaires, the billionaires have. It's an online service. It's completely automated. It invests your money for you. You sign up for an account. If you can actually do this uh, easily with no cost and, in fact, uh, just find out what they would do by going to Wealthfront.com. Uh, and in, in, in just minutes, you can get right to work. It will monitor your portfolio around the clock, taking action as an opportunity arises, automatically doing some very interesting stuff to manage taxes, whether you're investing for retirement or some other long-term goal, you want to buy a house, you want to buy a boat, uh, Wealthfront automatically rebalances your portfolio. This is absolutely critical and one of the things I always forget to do. Reinvests your dividends. And this is commission-free. Commission-free. It is software-based. It is brilliant. Um, I'll, as we as we keep doing these ads, I'll, I'll, I don't want to take up too much time here, but I'll I'll tell you a little bit more about the people behind this. 
and why I totally trust them. And I want so badly to do this. It's transparent. It's accessible. You can look at your accounts in one place. You can see exactly what's happening, what your trends are, what your, what your gains have been. You see every trade they make on your behalf right there on the dashboard, either on the desktop or on their mobile app. And they're doing things that are fairly sophisticated. Tax, something called tax loss harvesting and direct indexing. And that's going to optimize your after-tax returns and lower your tax bill. And this is all really good stuff. Now, you remember I said that sometimes an investment advisor could charge 1%, 2 even up to 3%. The cost for Wealthfront, and this is the only cost ever, one quarter of 1% a year, 25 basis points. There's no commission. There are no hidden fees. That's less than $5 a month if you're managing an account worth $30,000. And there are no additional charges. That's it. One quarter of 1% per year. That's why uh, they have now $2.4 billion in client assets. Uh, and they have grown 20 times. 20 times growth over the past two years. For compliance purposes, I have to tell you, Wealthfront Incorporated is an SEC-registered investment advisor. Brokerage services are offered through Wealthfront Brokerage Corporation, member FINRA and SIPC. This is not a solicitation to buy or sell securities. Investing in securities involves risks, and there is the possibility of losing money. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Please visit Wealthfront.com to read their full disclosure. I want to do this so badly. It's driving me crazy. But you can do it right now. Join Wealthfront. Start investing your money the right way. Wealthfront, Wealthfront, W-E-A-L-T-H-F-R-O-N-T dot com slash MacBreak. Sign up. You can get your free personalized investment portfolio. Just see what they would do on your behalf. You'll see the customized allocation. Everybody's a little different that they recommend. And here's a special deal. Because you're a Twit uh, viewer or listener, if you sign up to invest... You're going to get your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. There's no cost for the first $15,000 if you heard about it on MacBreak. Uh, I think this is a really good solution for anybody. But you can invest a small amount uh, and see how they do for you. I, I think what will happen is you'll after a year, you'll go, oh, gosh, I wish I put it all in there. Wealthfront.com slash MacBreak. Your first $15,000 entirely free of charge for life. That is nice. Wealthfront.com slash MacBreak. Now back to MacBreak Weekly. Andy? Thank you, Leo. He pre-taped that, but he already looks like he's more tan and rested, does he not? You can almost <laughs> smell the cocoa butter coming in through the Skype connection, or at least I could. Maybe it's just because I had a almond joy bar just before the show anyway that's neither here nor there uh big week last year uh, last week here in the united states as as the supreme court handed down a couple of uh, pretty big decisions uh one of them was to affirm uh marriage rights to all americans yay hey uh and also in uh, response to uh, uh some uh, rather tra rather tragic events uh we have finally realized that perhaps it is about darn time to stop flying the Confederate battle flag uh, above state capitals, and maybe it's even time for Amazon and other stores like that uh, to even stop selling those things. Uh, Tim Cook uh, has been on Twitter in response to a lot of these different, uh, lot of these different things. Uh, he, uh, after the Supreme Court decision, he uh, tweeted out the famous Apple line, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that do, and followed by today marks a victory for equality, perseverance, and love. Uh, and then in response to uh, the South Carolina shootings, he said, my thoughts are with the victim's family in South Carolina. Let's honor their lives by eradicating racism and removing the symbols and words that feed it, uh, which weren't just uh, idle words on Twitter uh, because uh, Apple uh, soon thereafter uh, started taking down uh, any iOS apps that uh, featured the Confederate ba battle flag and its icons and its uh, uh, and its screenshots and other things, uh, which caused a little bit of a kerfuffle because it wasn't just people who were just using it the way they stick it on the hood of uh, the uh, General Lee car on Dukes of Hazard, but also there were a lot of educational uh, games and educational programs teaching people about the Civil War that got uh, pulled down. Uh, Renee, is that a bit of a tempest in a teapot? Wouldn't we agree? 
Yeah, I mean, first, it's, it's really the way that you phrased that was so perfect because it does show the difference in the modern era of Apple where Tim, Clo sorry, Steve Jobs was really, it just works. And he believed it was inelegant to talk about social things. He would do that privately. And he was a big supporter of all these causes privately, but he didn't want Apple to get credit for doing it. He thought you should just do this stuff where Tim Cook really is, we believe, and he believes that using Apple as a moral entity as, as being part of equality movements and civil rights is almost like a duty. It's something that they've been gifted with all this power and wealth. And if they can help bring collective humanity into the light, then they have a moral imperative to do it. And the Confederate flag thing, I'm a Canadian, so I don't know if that means it's easier or harder for me to speak about the Confederate flag. And I do realize that I'm ignorant about a lot of it. I have seen the explainers saying that the history is not what people think it is. Uh, but what stood out for me was John Stewart when he was unable to give his monologue a few, I think it was like about a week ago. And he said that people in the U.S. are forced to drive on streets named after people who wanted to keep them slaves and look up and, and see flags for people who wanted to keep them slaves. And I think we've all in our lives, regardless of who we are, had moments where we felt less than or singled out or not chosen or abused or disadvantaged or discriminated against in some way. And if you, it, it's the same thing with, with, with feminism. If you expand that into the scope of large swaths of humanity, the weight of it sort of becomes crushing and you get this moment of empathy and enlightenment. And there is some criticism about how Apple goes about these things. They tend to take an ax to it and not a scalpel. And I forget who wrote that line, but it was a really good line. But there's a very sound psychological principle called decluttering where in order to affect change, if you want to get rid of all the old clothes in your wardrobe, if you want to clean out your kitchen, it doesn't work to just start looking through it and trying to evaluate it and throw things out piece by piece because you never really finish. What works is you take everything out and you put it in a big pile and then you carefully put back the things that are of great value or importance or are exceptions to the cleansing that you're doing. And that's traditionally been given all the legacy technology and the way that iTunes works and things that we don't need to go into now. But there's a lot of technical and and good reasons for doing things the way that they do them. And they are galling and they do affect some people who have legitimate apps. Uh, but you know what? Those people can be affected for a little while. I'm hugely sympathetic to the costs incurred on developers and the stress and anxiety, but it's fairly insignificant compared to the long historic damage that this kind of material has been doing. And some people thought that it devalues games, that Apple doesn't treat games with the same sort of seriousness that they treat documentaries or films or TV shows. But they're actually treating them with much more importance because they're interactive and you're not watching a documentary. You're choosing to play as a Confederate soldier, uh, which is sort of different than a World War II game when you're sort of marching people into incinerators. There's, there's a much more visceral connection to that stuff. And if they are going to err, they're going to err on the side of removing absolutely everything and then super carefully putting it back. So Tempest in the Teapot, yes, I understand people are going to react that way, especially people who have made really great historical content and, and value it. But the weight you place on that just has to be weighed against the, the, the history and the culture. And I think anyone with an ounce of compassion will see that this is a, that this is a very small uh, drop in the bucket of what's been happening. Yeah, you, you kind of hope that Apple is uh, that Apple is going to be a little bit cautious with this because it's very easy to be very to be repulsed by uh, by surface actions. There was uh, remember that there was a, a game a few years ago, a first person shooter that was set in the in the uh, Dallas uh, School Book Depository building. Yeah. That on the surface was you get to be Lee Harvey Oswald and you get to fire a gun at the president of the United States, but it was actually highly educational and in many ways highly important because. They decided they tried to duplicate the game, the, the physics, uh, the physics as well as they could. They duplicated the terrain as well as they could. They de they duplicated the performance of the gun as well as they could. And given that there are so many people these days who still believe that Lee Harvey Oswald could not have possibly been the lone gunman, it took only about a day for lots and lots of people to report that I was not only able to shoot the president in the time allotted, I was also able to take out the other two people in that car. But on the surface, it's a quite an, an, an offensive game, uh, Kelly and I. I apologize. I have. I, I want to. Sh I have. I had the wrong <laughs> note. I've been mispronouncing your name like all through the show because I wrote it down like this, uh, and it's Kelly Gamont. Yes. And I'm uh, maybe maybe it's just that I grew up with a name like Anatko, so I'm just I just don't believe that the default <laughs> position is for anybody to ever pronounce a name correctly. I thought it was Guimau. I was all. <laughs> <laughs> You're hiding you... your Frenchness. Don't don't put your light under a bar barrel, Kelly. No, no, uh, but, no. But I what, married what, what into all the Frenchness, so so it's really Mr. <laughs> Kelly that that you want to talk to. <laughs> but what what did you think about this decision? Was this, was this the right um, thing for Apple to be doing? 
Well, it, it's really kind of a, a damned if they do and damned if they don't when it comes to this because there are people who are going to be mad that they removed it, uh, particularly because, like Renee said, um, they basically yanked everything and put it in a pile and started walking back the stuff that was maybe the the historical things or the educational tools that people were using. And that's not the same as as having it be a game like you were talking about where you're shooting the president. That's not quite the same situation. So I'm really hoping that um, this is one of those things where when people realize it's just time to draw a line in the sand, that maybe the line is drawn and, and we can all just move on from that. Um, I, I I was really also struck by the same thing that Renee was struck by in John Stewart talking about the, the shootings at the church where uh, black people have to drive on these roads that are named after people who wanted to oppress them and own them. And uh, I was very, it was, it was very striking to me that that would be a thing. So, um, cause I don't live in the South and I have not spent a lot of a significant amount of time in the Southern U S. So uh, I don't see a whole lot of that, but it was a very vivid example of uh, some of the, the unbelievable lack of awareness, I think on some people's part, um, how this might feel to someone else. And I feel like uh, the the compassion is there and this is Apple trying to do the right thing. And I actually sort of prefer the new Apple coming out and taking these sort of stances and saying these sorts of things. Um, like when uh, Tim Cook was at the uh, WWDC scholarship reception and one of the girls that was there uh, thanked him for doing this. And he said, oh, I'm going to do this till my toes point up. It was yeah. in the video that I saw. And I I thought it was really great that this is something that Apple is doing because I feel like this is an example they can lead by. And um, and this is just another way that Apple can sort of prove that they're they're a company with a very specific vision and, and doing things to execute on that. And I don't think there's anything at all wrong with uh, Tim making these kind of statements and, and being someone who uh, has a comment, whatever it may be, on some of these issues. And even if I did not necessarily agree with him on whatever it was, uh, I still really appreciate that he's coming out and saying these things that he, that he has been saying and making these statements and taking these actions. And I really appreciate it. Yeah. I, I've always thought that some, uh, there, for a long time, Apple had one sort of message they wanted to say when they were producing an ad and trying to sell something. But so when they're trying to sell people iPads, they're going to talk about freedom and spirit and creativity and how we're all one planet of people. But then when it comes to, well, that would be great if you could back this legislation, it would be great if you'd be show, create, come up with a statement on this issue that reflects society. And they would always be very, very quiet about that sort of stuff. Uh, and Apple senior executives were never the sort of people who would ever speak on anything uh, in public that was not directly related to, uh, to Apple and not uh, so carefully curated. So it's great to see this human side of Apple leaking out, uh, that uh, realizing that's not just uh, something that they do when their desire for social justice intersects with their company interests. They can just simply put out a simple message that will be so empowering to so many different people. There was a wonderful picture that was tweeted out that I saw over the weekend uh, that uh, the San Francisco Pride March, where you see, of course, huge, huge, huge parade, and you see this wave of white shirts that mm -hmm. goes on mm -hmm. for like two, three, four blocks. And the caption explained that these are all Apple employees wearing an Apple t-shirt uh, for San Francisco Pride. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't, I, I certainly don't think Apple was ever a company that uh, discouraged uh, their employees from uh, uh, from uh, living the lives that uh, that uh, they should be leading, uh, but I I could see a while back where they would not be as uh, as interested in making sure that look we are we are part of this community. Our people are everybody's people, uh, and, and one of the things I've always loved about the Apple Store is that you just to, to the level of the people that are simply working in these mall stores that you do see a great range of diversity. I, I love the fact that you see these uh, Apple geniuses and uh, other people on the floor who are wearing their Apple t-shirts, but they've got like full sleeves uh, tattoos. They've got <laughs> tattoos in their hands and on their necks. Uh, and this is something that would remove them from consideration from a store that sells $10,000 gold watches. But for, with Apple, it's like, no, it's 
We, we're, we are too smart mm -hmm. to be distracted by uh, idiocy like judging people for uh, for how they dress uh, for uh, the for their appearance or, or anything like that. So I, I think I think it's a, it, I think it's a really great thing, and it, it makes you happier with the amount of money that you're spending at Apple. Um, there was another interesting thing, though. Uh, speaking of games, though, uh, they're also asking developers, game developers, when they're preparing artwork screenshots for uh, for the App Store to blur out or pixelate shot images of guns or any person-on-person uh, -person violence, um, which is an interesting move because when you're talking about uh, getting rid of the Confederate battle flag, which is, again, a it's really like a Nazi flag. It, there is no way to spin this in a way that you're not saying that this flag is in support of man's brutality, uh, humanity's brutality against humanity. Whereas there are book covers that feature guns and there are movie posters that feature acts of violence against people. Celebrate that, them. Well, not even celebrate them. I mean, Anatomy of a Murder is uh, 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 Saul Bass's uh, uh, iconic movie poster is uh, certainly a representational figure of a dead body. But that's how you basically s explain here is the tone of the movie and here's what it's about. Is mm -hmm. it maybe a little bit different to say that we're going to make sure that you can't... Uh, uh, you should not be able to kids who are just browsing the store should not be able to see images of guns. People should not see images of violence. Does that go one step too far or is that just simply another expression of a very so, consistent uh, social responsibility, Renee? So I have, yeah, I, I have really mixed feelings about this. And I, I remember you probably too as well, guys, that, you know, when they started censoring, um, and I should not use that word because I, I take exception with the word censoring because that's typically when an outside party uh, forces change on you. But when you when you exercise editorial discretion, uh, when they started doing that with cartoons, the first pass was just you couldn't understand it. Looney Tunes would come on and the show would make no sense to you, and they'd be cutting out s like like uh, birds smoking cigars and 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 all sorts of uh, now mm -hmm. completely inappropriate humor. But over time, they got much better at editing it and digitally removing it, and now the shows make sense again. But the thing for me is um, I live in Quebec, and you could watch like basically instinct on French TV at nine o'clock and nobody says anything about it. And, and the, the, oh, the weight given to what we want to censor or, or editorially cut when it comes to sex is completely different than violence. So I can't watch Game of Thrones a lot of the time, not because there's sex on it, but because I find the violence just uh, absolutely dehumanizing and horrible. And I, and I don't want to subject myself to it. And Having that kind of stuff in the app store, and I'll go so far as to say removing Confederate flags is great, but there's all sorts of misogyny and other, and other problematic content uh, in the app store that maybe needs to be looked at as well. I don't know. But the idea of just um, pixelating it, I, I think, doesn't really solve the problem of, of whether that content should be there and how that content should be represented, because that's not an accurate portrayal of what's in there. And it feels like almost you're dodging the, the social consequence of extreme violence by tidying up the poster or the packaging for it. Maybe don't have screenshots that show those elements or maybe have better restrictions in place so that when people set parental controls, those apps not only can't download but can't be shown to you. And yes, that requires more work on the iTunes backend and whatever. So maybe this is a stopgap measure. Um, but again, I, I would rather that content not be presented than it sort of just be pixelated or, 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 or smoked over. Yeah, but it's it, it, it reminded me the first time I saw it, we see this obvious shot of you know uh, your, your basic first person shooter and then you see pixels over it. i immediately thought of et and fbi agents that are suddenly running and holding walkie talkies <laughs> like this uh, waving walkie talkies <laughs> threateningly at kids yeah exactly uh, what do you think about this kelly i mean there's it's it's interesting when you think about that apple is can says consistently exercised one set of uh as a storekeeper, they have the ability to decide what they want to sell. They have a, one set of rules for their uh, for their gaming and their, for their app content, but a mm -hmm. much more flexible set of rules for their books and their movies and their TV shows. Is there, is well, there sort of a disconnect here? Yes and no, because uh, content-wise, it's entirely possible. Um, one of the things that uh, that I was when I was thinking about this, one of the things that uh, I was wondering about was. Yeah, what about, you know, doing this stuff in a, with a movie or with a book? But, um, you know, if if you have an issue with gun violence and they want to take it an, an app out of the store that contains guns uh, because of the content of it, you know, that's one thing. Like, that's one of the reasons that there are human reviewers in the app store and all of that. Um, with an album, like, um, uh, why can't I think of the name of the album? But Jay-Z's 99 Problems, I think we can all agree that's probably not something that you kind of want to expose grade schoolers to. That's that, that may not be the best example for them. Um, and, and that's just a file. 
So that file is not going to hurt my computer. So I think that's part of where the flexibility comes from is because the spotlight isn't necessarily shining on that stuff because there's the explicit tag on the music and there's the age restrictions in the iTunes store for a lot of stuff. But um, I'm, I'm curious where sort of where the spotlight is going to shine next, depending on what happens. I think there's, um, I think this is one of those things that just should have been part of the app store in the first place that there shouldn't have been a lot of yay confederate flag kind of stuff um for for a lot of reasons and so it it seems like this the same sort of thing should be applied to the books and the movies and everything else as well um but then you get into context and you get into um what exactly are they trying to say and is it just that you want to take this movie out because it's an accurate portrayal of the Civil War? Maybe you can leave that in, even though it was fiction. And, you know, it turns into a, a really long and excruciating debate, you know, on on every side, mostly because uh, you end up with with stuff like this. You know, we, you end up with a with a weird line. You know, we know it when we see it and and that's what needs to go. And, you know, that kind of thing. But kind of the other thing I was wondering about all of this was people saying, oh, those poor developers who got their apps pulled from the store. Um, I kind of have to wonder, unless it's it's one of the, like an educational app or a, an app that's, that's relating information about the Civil War and things like that. Um, I kind of wonder what, what kind of app would you have put in the app store that would otherwise contain a Confederate flag that is now no longer in the app store? Yeah, I mean, the, the difficulty is that, and this is, uh, of course, it goes well beyond, it well goes well beyond digital content. Um, there have been discussions about those uh, Civil War monuments that uh, John Stewart talked about, and one answer could be to simply pull these monuments down because you're basically honoring someone who was fighting a cause that was not simply misguided, but there you could make the argument that it was just downright evil. Uh, on the other hand, the other argument would be leave it up, but also have another permanent marker next to it that gives this monument context. Because it seems like it would be a missed opportunity to pretend as though this stuff didn't exist, uh, and that right. and to hide the fact that we were collectively willing to tolerate this for a full century, and that there's now a bare spot of earth where we were too embarrassed to leave something standing up. There was a you talk about the Looney Tunes cartoons. Uh, one of the nice, one of the one of the best answers that I've seen to this sort of problem is that when Warner Brothers releases a DVD containing content that contains uh, racist material, like uh, a lot of the World War II uh, cartoons, there is they don't make any changes to the cartoon whatsoever. They simply add a non-skippable thing to the beginning that simply, uh, a phrase that simply says, this is a product of its time. It is horribly, mm -hmm. essentially, it's, it's horribly racist. We feel as though it is right to present this in context rather than to pretend that we never produced this to begin with. Uh, and uh, at the, at, at, on the other hand, there are going to be people who are going to be taking, uh, pardon, pardon the use of what is a, a, a very offensive term, but this is uh, the name of the cartoon, just to show you. There is a cartoon called Bugs Bunny Nips the Nips, and uh, depicting uh, Japanese people in a much more, in, no, so not a much more, in a downright racist way that mm -hmm. when they depicted the Italians and the Germans that they didn't do, it seems as though you need to teach people that this was this was con considered to be popular entertainment of the time. If you simply try to snip out those scenes and, you know, produce a one minute, eight second cartoon or make sure that you could, that's impossible to be seen, it seems as though you're trying not to talk about that relative of yours that worked for the SS, you know? Yeah, it's it's super interesting, and it's interesting to me as a, as someone who was born in South Africa too, because I remember in the days of apartheid where you couldn't fly South African planes over most countries, you couldn't uh, South African teams couldn't go to do sporting events at some countries, and that that was starkly different because uh, if you look at the if you look at how you know the populations have been treated in North America, a lot of the stuff in South Africa was modeled on North, the North American treatment of Native peoples, and yet the the, the standard of measure was so different. Um, but when Nelson Mandela took power, he didn't strip away the Springbok symbols, for example. Uh, if you can watch Invictus, it's a very movie-like, Clint Eastwood movie-like rendition of all this, but it gives you the idea. And he was very cognizant of the of the roles of symbolism and in letting people save face and slowly sort of walking people into the light and not dropping them in the boiling ocean of light because uh, it creates resistance. But I think apps and games are inherently different because it's not legacy content. It's not something that aired at a certain time uh, and, and it can be presented in that context. It's something that's new and fresh and is always, uh, always sort of existing. And it's not like these are Civil War apps that used to be appropriate 
appropriate, an hour no longer appropriate, and we're putting this warning up saying it was produced in its time. This is stuff all being produced now. And you have to sort of, I think, treat that a little bit differently because you can't, it's, it's a modern context no matter what the historical presentation is. So if it's, if it's designed to teach you something, that's great. If it's designed to sort of evoke a feeling of a better time that people want to associate with, then that gets into that line that Kelly uh, mentioned where humans have to make a curated decision. And that's sort of both the best and worst thing about the App Store is their inherent humanism about determining this stuff. Mm. But sh should Apple worry about a... Uh app or a piece of content that was created in completely good faith, but which can be misappropriated by a third party and whose purpose can be perverted to other ends. Should they take a Walmart sort of approach and simply say that we've decided that there's certain types of content that we simply don't want to put on the store shelves? In Walmart's case, it is more of a, we have a very conservative customer base. We simply don't want to have content that might offend our conservative customers. Apple, it'd be more like uh, we want to respect artistic expression while not creating, uh, becoming a sales force for content that can hurt other people. But how, how far do you think Apple should think into this uh, in order to retain their, uh, their their sense of social honor in the stuff that they sell. And isn't it interesting too, because this is such an American thing, because that flag is meaningless to a lot of people around the world, but they might have a flag that is just as horrific. To, it might maybe the, there's some places in the world where the English flag uh, connotes all sorts of really different things. And Apple is an American company and, and America is their biggest market. So it's, it's interesting to see, but you know, China is becoming a huge market. At what point do, do sort of international sensitivities start to play? I think it's an endlessly fascinating and problematic subject. And I don't think there's any easy answers. And I, and I do think that Apple's taking the right approach. And this is, and this is, we should say, a very typical Apple approach. Where there's been so many times where Apple has basically just pulled up the drawbridge and left a lot of people stranded. There's, there's, there are two places, two positions for the drawbridge, up or down. And so they will simply pull it up while they decide what fine, what, what kind of finer tuned response they want to create. And uh, we're not talking about uh, content that is offensive. We're talking about should active apps, should, uh, should, uh, should apps be able to put active content in the, in the notifications bar where they just simply have to put, drop down the hammer on everything and then decide what they want to let back in. So if Apple makes one of these really, really broad decisions, it's not that this is the only decision they're going to make. You can expect them to continue to think about this and sort of meter that approach as they continue to reflect upon it. So um, let's see, let's, uh, let's, we, a couple other things uh, we want to get to. Uh, just today, Apple lost its latest appeal on the ebook pricing, price fixing scandal. Uh, so now they have essentially two practical responses at this point, either pay, pay $450 million uh, in, <laughs> in damages, which will mostly go to readers, uh, or take this to the Supreme Court. Apple has released a statement that uh, asserts that, no, 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 I don't care what the court said. We did not do anything wrong. Uh, we did not commit price fixing, and we're going to consider all options. Uh, what do, Kelly, what, what do you hope they're going to do? Is it, do you just hope, isn't there a time you just hope these lawsuits just go away however they're going to go away? Yeah, I kind of hope, you know, there's a dance off or something <laughs> uh, just so that we don't have to do this anymore. You know, two books enter, one book leaves. Like, I don't even care anymore. Um, and the reason I have such a hard time with this lawsuit in particular, um, what's funny is that it's sort of like um, celebrity deaths. It seems like Apple <laughs> lawsuit news comes in threes all the time. So when I started hearing started hearing stuff about this one, I just thought, oh, what are the other two going to be? Um, so in this case, uh, I think it's fascinating that it's Apple being roasted over the fire for this behavior when we've seen so much worse from Amazon since this happened. <laughs> and that to me is the thing that's sort of astounding. You know, like maybe I get pulled over for going 56 in a 55 while somebody going 90. That was me, is, sorry. Oh, well, <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, well, somebody going 90, you know, is is whipping by me and and the cop's like, yeah, yeah, that's, th you know, that's them. But we're here to talk about you. And it it almost feels like a witch hunt maybe at this point to be pointing Apple out as the example of everything that's wrong in the book industry, which is how some of the press has decided to portray this, that Apple is the problem. And, and I kind of think, you know, there's another company and it starts with A and they sell a fair number of digital books and, and maybe it's time to, to shine a little light that direction too. Um, 
So really, I think you're right, Andy, at this point, I just want it to stop um, because <laughs> I kind of want it to go to the Supreme Court just because I really, I'm a principal person <laughs> and I'm the kind of person who would hold on to something like that and be like, no, this is what's going to happen because I know that I'm right and I know that you don't have a case and I want to go, you know, I want to make absolutely certain beyond a shadow of a doubt that everybody knows that you don't have a case. So yeah, I just wonder how I, I sort of wonder how it's going to go. And I like, on the one hand, I'm sort of like, you know, you go Apple. And on the other hand, I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. That's see, that's, it's a lot of this sounds like that friend of yours that you just want to say after four and a half months, I will pay the $250 parking ticket. Okay. Let's stop. <laughs> you, you, you lost it when it was $64. And then when you went back, it was $128. Let's just pay it and move on with our lives. We're moving, we're losing more mm -hmm. of that money and gas money to the courthouse. But yes. now, but actually, no, you, you've something that you, that you said uh, actually has changed my mind a little bit. I hope that, uh, that I hope that Apple does decide, no, no, we shall fight until our, our voices crack and our feet hurt. We will fight this <laughs> injustice because, if there's if there's been uh, part of the joy of the uh, of uh, the uh, uh, affirmation of uh, of marriage rights has been the comedy coming from Justice Scalia, and I just want to see what, what <gasps> Scalia would have to say, yes. not only to try, try to explain how this technology works, but what he would come up with when he gets when things do not go his way. So now now there's, I'm saying I, I will okay, I will yes. kick in. If, there, if there's an Indiegogo for the Apple's legal fund, I will kick in $50. <laughs> I, I, will, I will kick in at least to the T-shirt level for this just to see. I will see what, absolutely buy the T-shirt for this. I, I think there's one thing, though, that I wonder if Apple's reaction to this or all of our reactions to this would be different if it hadn't been for the way that, like, I, I think you can absolutely make a case and you can, like, that Apple did things that were probably inappropriate, especially the most favored nation clause. But when you look at Judge Cote and the, the, the supervisor they put in place and then the person he had to hire because he didn't know how to do the job that she that she had him do even though he's a friend that that whole thing just looked so fishy that I think it sort of cast a pall over it if it had been a straightforward legal decision you did this wrong you have to change this and this and none of this super, the trustee thing had happened I wonder if Apple would have you know disagreed with it paid their fine and moved on but it feels like uh, and I'm forgetting his name I'm blanking on his name now but it feels like Cote's supervisor or trustee whatever the totally blanking whatever he is as well, too. If he wasn't involved, it'd be much less of a thorn in their side and something they wouldn't perhaps fight so uh, aggressively. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kelly. No, that was just agreeing. That was it. There you go. <laughs> We are in agreement. Uh, before we take a break, one last thing that's kind of interesting. Uh, Bloomberg is has a thin piece uh, claiming that Apple has actually started early production of new iPhone models with a feature called Force Touch. I'll repeat that, Force Touch, uh, which senses how hard users are pressing down on a screen. People with knowledge of the matter said. Uh, the newest phones in the same 4.7 inch and 5.5 inch versions as the current iPhone 6 and 6 Plus devices will have a similar exterior design. Uh, volume manufacturing is scheduled to ramp up as soon as next month, according to this Bloomberg business piece. It's going to be another um, iPhone, Andy? Really? They're going to make another iPhone this year? What it's the hell it's, irrespons you say? it's irresponsible for us to talk about rumors, Renee. I mean, it just... They, should, it they just should just cancel it so we have... I mean, there's too much on the Apple masthead. Just cancel the iPhone and put their attention on hot tubs or something. <laughs> yeah. We, well, we need more room for the <laughs> Apple TV because that's that's yeah. that's becoming the their, their, their boutique uh, business by <sighs> now. But Every year I, we get these stories. Every year, new iPhone production, every, a new version of iOS being tested. It's so funny. Yeah, but it, it does it does raise an interesting question. I mean, do you think I do you? I don't. I'm not sure that Apple can do force touch in a phone this year. I'm I'm sure it's coming because I mean it's it's so it's so useful on the on the watch. It's so useful uh, on the trackpad of the of the new MacBook uh, and the new MacBooks. It seems like a natural thing for them to put on iOS devices as well. But I don't think they're there. They're, it's going to be this year. What My understanding think? is that there's typically several prototypes, maybe two, maybe three, um, maybe four, I guess, depending on it. And there is more uh, sort of conservative and more aggressive prototypes. And you could find, for example, uh, an iPhone prototype that has no home button that uses the screen and force yeah. touch for a virtual home button or home button on the side. Or, or there's all, they try on any, almost anything we could think of in a podcast or someone could write on a blog. They have the wealth and the skill and the intelligence to prototype. Uh, and we've said this before, you know, when Phil Schiller says he doesn't like touchscreen iMacs, it's not because he just woke up deciding that, it's because he tried them and really doesn't like them. So I'm sure that there is that 
prototype um, iPhone that has the force touch. And if it works, they're going to move it into production, which is what Bloomberg is saying they're doing. And if it doesn't, there's probably a prototype that they have all ready to go that doesn't include force touch and we'll get it as soon as it's ready. But, uh, you know, based on the size of the iPhone screen, it doesn't look that much different than the iMac trackpad. So hopefully if, if they can get the, the number of parts into production, uh, it should be okay for them. Yeah, and we're assuming that they mean something like uh, what works on the uh, on the Apple Watch. Maybe they just mean that instead of having a mechanical clicky button for the home button, there'll be still a divot on the screen, but instead of having a clicky button, it will be a force touch responder. This uh, one still has a. This one still has a home button, as far as I know, but you you can do the force touch to get the context menus and the um, what's it called, pressure sensitive drawing stuff. Yeah, the home it, button it, one I think is further out. It's weird. I mean, I've I. I still, after six weeks with the Apple Watch, I don't know what force touch means, <laughs> which is troubling because I consider myself to be a partially educated person uh, <laughs> about iOS devices. And the fact that I've been using this for a month and a half and I still don't instinctively think, oh, I want to get this on the app. Oh, of course, that's something I would have to force touch to get. So I think they still have a lot of psychological engineering to do before they figure it out. I mean, uh, Kelly, you, you have an Apple Watch, right? I do not. Oh, you don't? Okay. Um, I don't, but I have the um, the current model 13-inch MacBook, which does right. have the Force Touch trackpad, which I love. Um, it's And it's, it's not even because I, I run a bunch of apps that take advantage of it or anything. It's just because I'm usually a um, tap to click on the trackpad and not actually clicking it. And with the Force Touch, I actually get sort of that first layer of clicking and it's exactly the reason that I turned off the the clicking in the first place because it was always so hard to do. And now it's very easy and I really, really like it. Um, I can't wait to see what sort of stuff ends up actually implementing that as part of the application. So I think they're, I think it's great. Um, I don't think we're going to see it this year. And the reason I don't think that is because Apple just bought the company, bought a bunch of patents off a company um, for force touch sorts of things and uh, so one of the waves of information that people, one of the waves of conclusions, I guess, not really information that people were drawing on this was that this meant the home button was going away. And I don't think the home button is necessarily going away. I think what will probably happen is that we'll end up with a divot, like you said, Andy, um, because the home button has been the bane of a few models of iPhone when it comes to the thing, what fails after about 18 months. Um, yeah. You know, I know Mr. Kelly for a long time had an iPhone 4 and people kept going, wow, and your home button still works? Like people were just stunned. So um, I I don't think we'll get anything this year because I think when it comes to deploying it on any scale larger than a watch, that it's going to end up needing more improvement and more refinement and that it's going to end up being something more like um, next year. In, in whatever the seven ends up being, if if we get a success this year and next year is the seven, um, it's something we will see more next fall, I think, than than this one, just to make, because Apple wants the experience to be right. And, you know, we know that. And particularly if you are in the boat with me of Apple TV fans who are really not being patient about waiting for the next one, then, <laughs> you know, you're just hoping that you, you've pinned all of that on. I really want this to be a good experience and it's not yet. So it's not out yet. And I'm really hoping that uh, next year will be the case for that. Only because I find that if I need to grab for my phone and I'm not looking at it, I need to be able to tell which part is the top and which yeah. part is the bottom. Yeah. yeah one, one of the nice see the home button gone for years. Well, for a couple of yeah. years. It's, it's, it's so iconic for so many reasons. And also, I mean, it's, it's amazing uh, when you look at how simple human engineering considerations can, add, can create a feature that's just as good as something that seems complicated for actual hardware engineering. Uh, I love the Moto X. One of the reasons why I love it is that they put a little divot on the back at the top of the screen that just immediately orients it in your hand. So you know you're, you're, you know you're, you're holding it right side up. You also know that it's, it feels a bit more secure in your pocket. And all they had to do was just sort of, you know, lick your thumb on the clay mall, go, 
and here you go. We just put a dividend on the screen. <laughs> oh, it's worth adding that uh, the same way when Apple hears we need multitasking, they're like, oh, no, what you really want is, is surfing Safari while you're listening to Pandora. Here's an API for you. The whole reason for exploring home buttonless iPhones is people saying we want small screen iPhones again, like the iPhone uh, 4 or 4S. And what Apple hears is, oh, the case, like the whole package is too big for you. So if we could reduce the casing around it, you could still have a big screen and not have to worry about reaching all the corners or using it one handed. So it's an exploration sort of how can we solve the real problem you have? and not any particular aversion to hardware features or not. Christina Warren is back. Hallelujah. Ooh. We were just talking before we go into picks of the week, we were talking about the idea of a forced, uh, Bloomberg had that piece about uh, a possible forced touch uh, iPhone uh, this year and not next year. Uh, what do you think about forced touch on an iPhone and what do you think of it happening maybe this year? Yeah, no, so, my, so I, and I don't, I, I don't want to repeat too much of what you guys have already said. I guess my big question would be, are they putting force touch on the home button? Because if they do that, that makes total sense, right? Um, as Kelly was saying, so many of those buttons fail. It would be like a great way of like removing a, a, move, a moving part. If they do it on the screen, I wonder if that adds too much UI complexity because already on the Apple Watch, I find myself like I, I don't always know when to when to force touch. And so I wonder how much like training it would take um, and, and what it would do to developers, um, it, it, especially, you know, to, to give it to us like this year um, uh, to, to start to build those things in. Um, but I don't, I, I don't, I, I think that, that we've heard so many rumors, it seems likely we'll probably see something force touch like. Uh, I just don't know if it's going to be on the screen or if it'll be on the button. Um, I would, I probably eventually would, I would be okay with the home button going away. But as you said, Andy, I mean, it's so iconic. I don't, I don't know what they would do without it, it, it to a certain degree. Yeah, it's a, it's easier to imagine at this point an iPhone with sharp corners than an iPhone without a home button for me. <laughs> right. Super, so, so true. <laughs> that's a the triangular I think, iPhone. I, I think I wonder if Apple has ever like sent out when they need to do actual real world field radio testing. If they just simply will make a few cases with sharp corners on them, they will never ever in a million years think that this is an actual iPhone. <laughs> uh, we are going to be right back with our picks of the week. Before that, we have another message from the recationing Leo Laporte. Leo. Hey, let me, let me interrupt for just a little bit, Andy. I've come back from the grave. Looks like I'm, I don't know, in the afterlife to, have, <laughs> to, to tell you about LegalZoom. Uh, we, I'm a fan of LegalZoom. You know, I used them 10 years ago to incorporate Twit. We're still using the same legal documents that I paid so little for back then. Uh, so many reasons why a smart business person might choose LegalZoom. I, Kevin Rose told me to. Um, but I'm telling you to, it'll help you incorporate if you're starting a business or form an LLC. That's what we did. Uh, or do a nonprofit. I actually investigated that at LegalZoom and it was, it is really, um, for a lot of you, a good choice. You can also register your trademark to protect your products and services. You can even file for a patent with the help of LegalZoom.com for a lot less than a law firm. They're not a law firm, but they also can help you get advice from an attorney. They built a network of independent attorneys in most states to provide you with legal advice and other useful services to help you run your new business. So you can go to LegalZoom.com, pick an attorney based on their profile, but also reviews from LegalZoom clients. Uh, whether you need a contract reviewed or advice on whether you should incorporate or form an LLC, Chapter S, Chapter C, Chapter LLC, what's the difference, what state you should do it in. Um, those legal questions you can get answered too. Start with LegalZoom.com. Complete transparency, upfront pricing, customer reviews, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. LegalZoom. Make the smart choice for your business. LegalZoom.com. And by the way, if you use the offer code MBW at checkout, you'll get a little bit back and they'll know where you heard about. LegalZoom.com. Offer code MBW. Legal help is here at LegalZoom.com. Now back to the panel at MacBreak Weekly, Andy. I'm a big fan of the the sort of Aloha shirt that still makes you look like a vacationing <laughs> clergyman. You know, black and a little bit <laughs> muted green, but not really a whole lot of colors. That's that, that that's that's in my closet right now. Uh, time for picks of the week. Uh, we're going to start off with Kelly Gamont. Kelly, what's your pick this week? Okay, so since we've got Apple Music now and everybody's uh, going to be listening to their phone a lot more, I thought that this would be a super fantastic pick. Um, this is a, what I'm, what I'm picking here is a case for headphones. And that sounds kind of silly, but I'm about to tell you why it's awesome. So this is from Square Jellyfish at squarejellyfish.com. 
And the reason it's neat is because you pop it open and there's your headphones. And they can be the ear pods or the earbuds. It doesn't matter. They make a flavor for, for each kind of Apple headphone. And just like the box that you have, they wind around and then they, they slide the prong, the jack up the middle right there like that. But here's why this one is great. So when you close it, it's super compact and it's it's one piece. So you don't have to worry about losing it. Like if you were saving the Apple box and winding your headphones in that. Here's the reason that I think this one is fantastic. Because if you press a little bit, it goes like this. And the Ooh. top becomes a place where you can set your phone. Cool. Or your iPad mini. Um, I've used a full-size iPad with varying degrees of success, but it'll hold your phone either direction, vertically or horizontally. It's fantastic with an iPad mini. And it's got uh, a little bit of rubber on the edges where it uh, would hit the deck. So if you like to use your phone or your iPad on an airplane and you need your headphones, I got you. Because the rubber keeps it from shaking most of, most of the way. Like it helps a lot of the vibration of the, the tray on the airplane. So that's why I like this. And they will, um, you can get them in a bunch of colors. And uh, I think they're right around like $5 for one of these. Um, and I, I love mine. I take it everywhere. Uh, I think it's, it's just fantastic. In fact, I got one. And what I did was uh, I, bought a, I bought a second one uh, at Macworld. And I think I bought it for like $5 or something a couple of years ago. And I just love them because it's so the handiest thing. And uh, that's my pick this week. Wow, they got, they got a whole bunch of cool stuff like that. They've got a pocket tripod. They've got a they do. car vent mount. They, okay, so they, they know what they're doing. This is cool <laughs> stuff. I, I really like square, all the square jellyfish stuff. I have uh, the, the tripod piece. Um, I have the pocket tripod like that one there. I have the, um, the phone mount which has the, the screw hole in the bottom to put it on a tripod, but it, it slides open to hold whatever device you want to have hold it. And it's uh, really great. I like all of their stuff. I've used it. I drop it in the bottom of my backpack or in my shoulder bag when I'm headed somewhere. And uh, I'm not the most careful person with my stuff. And all my, all my square jellyfish stuff still looks great. It manages to survive me. Yeah. So I feel like that's a pretty good sign. I, I love um, the design. I mean, if you're if you're a, if you're a, uh, an accessory designer, I want you to think about the prototype you're building, no matter what it is, right now, and think: Is there a way we can add a simple feature that also turns it into a phone or iPad stand? Mm -hmm. Because there almost certainly is a way you can do that. And when we mm -hmm. discover that, oh my God, I thought this was just a stylus, but if I twist this end and pull it out, legs pop out, and hey, now I've got an iPhone stand. I will put an extra piece of money into a box and mail it to you because that's that's clever. That's just good thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, Christina, what's your pick this week? <laughs> All right, so my my pick is uh, an amazing amazing game called Yoko's Chess Game. Yoko Ono has a chess uh, game, you guys. <laughs> oh my um, god. Yeah, it is. It's, it's as fabulous as you thought it would be. Um, it's bizarre as all get out. Uh, she has a couple different modes. It's, it's got a standard mode. Um, there's a doggy chess mode where all the pieces are dogs and it makes noise. Um, it's got weird ass background music from off of her latest album in the background. And um, she's got this, this mode called trust mode where all the pieces are white and you basically have to trust I guess like like what pieces are yours and what pieces are are the opponents. Um, it's it's a free app. The, the the trust mode and the doggy mode are in app purchases. Uh, well worth the money because the the dog sounds are fantastic. It's not <laughs> a bad chess game, but it's so freaking weird that it has to be my pick of the week because it's so bizarre. <laughs> the Yoko Ono has a chess game. Wow, playing chess on the honor system. That's yeah. something that a lot of elderly men will get very, very angry about. Uh, <laughs> yes, and also if you read, if you if you read like the, it's just, it's it's worth getting just to to, uh, to to read the rules that she's written. Um, it's just bizarre. It's so great. Did it break up the king and bishop? <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah, well, I mean, that's a low blow. I mean, and basically, she's she's proving like how she was able to beat the other three, you know, um, <laughs> Beatles um, at chess. Clearly, no, it's a, this is it. It we we found this yesterday, and I I um, when I haven't been playing with Apple Music, I've been playing this. It's Yoko Ono has it has an iPhone app. You guys, that's cool. Is that, <laughs> they, they they just released that. I bet it's for it just there, came there's out. A, there's a there's a one woman. She's she has a one woman show at MoMA right now. 
uh, <laughs> and which you get you get to oh, there's also a lot of like interactive things on the wall that are kind of similar to that. So that's <laughs> that's, awesome. that's pretty cool. Yeah, apparently this the 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 the, the, the trust game was was built out of uh, some sort of actual thing that she created in like 1996 for some installation. So yeah, I mean she's apparently been at this chess thing for a while, and now she's nap. Okay. What, what, what is the Yoko Gambit? Like if, the, the, if there's an opening <laughs> move called the Yoko. <laughs> <laughs> I will, I will no leave comments. that as an exercise for the listener. Uh, <laughs> Renee, what's your pick this week? Right, so I have a pick, but I just wanted to mention in passing that iBooks got updated and there's now audiobooks inside iBooks. So if you've always hankered to have all your books uh, written and spoken all in one place, there's that. And I too, sorry, iBooks author now finally... Uh, uh, supports the iPhone as well. So if you've always wanted your iTunes author, your iBooks author stuff on your iPhone, you can get that as well. And it looks like iTunes update still hasn't come out and a couple of other Apple's updates for today still haven't come out. So there's more goodies, uh, hopefully, as the day progresses. Yeah, My it, pick, it was though, most, is... It was mostly sorry? an update for, for Apple Music. The, the other cool thing that you'll want to know is that uh, they did fix that uh, messages bug where if someone sends you the message of doom, it, does, it no longer locks up <laughs> your messaging Woo! app. So they, that did, they, they decided they, they thought about it both ways. They decided maybe it works better if you can't lock up the phone with the message of doom. <laughs> uh, so Unicode is hard. <laughs> uh, so my pick is uh, Camera, Camera Obscura, and it's an app by Ben Rice, uh, who's a young developer, but he, he's a photographer. He did all the photographs for the Ool conference, um, if you're familiar with that conference. Uh, he's very good, and he sort of wanted a camera app that was just really fun to use, and he really succeeded brilliantly in making that. So it gets a lot of stuff out of your way. It does have filters. It does have manual controls. But it, all of it is is super accessible. Um, and it, it's sort of for the person who just wants to take a great picture. They want to have a little bit more control over it than you know, maybe the basic built-in iOS camera app. But they don't want to be futzing with every dial or every switch and spending a lot of time and maybe having... Uh, their pixel dog run away from them before the shot is has taken place. <laughs> so it's it's on the app store. You can you can get it now. Their filters are an, an extra in-app purchase, but they're totally worth it. Um, I think it's Gotham-like filter is enough uh, to sort of make Rans even happy. So uh, if you are in, really into iPhone photography and you do love your new camera apps, give Camera Obscura a look. It's totally worth it. Cool. Um, my pick of the week is actually mostly for people who are listening live. Uh, app Camp for Girls is having their fundraising, an Indiegogo fundraising campaign. You can still uh, throw money into the kitty to make today and tomorrow, July 1st. You should definitely do that because there, there, are, there are some organizations that I think that they should basically have baskets full of money for all the money being thrown at them. Uh, and Kelly, App Camp for Girls is definitely that. Maybe you can do a better job than I can explaining uh, how cool App Camp for Girls is. Um. <laughs> I talk about it all the time. And so it's so you'd think I'd be way better at this. Um, <laughs> App Camp for Girls is amazing. What we do is we take uh, girls who are going into grade eight and grade nine. And uh, so that's about 12, 13 years old. And uh, for a week, we have day camp and they come in each day. We give them an, an iPod touch to use for the week and they learn about developing apps and they use MacBook Pros and they use Xcode and they have to type stuff in Xcode. And uh, there's bugs in the app. They have to find them. They have to fix them. And at the end of the week, they have to pitch their app to a panel of investors. And uh, we really have the most amazing time uh, getting the, getting them excited about uh, software. And the reason that it's exciting is because every time we do it, every time we do uh, the camp, there's uh, teams of four. We team the girls up in groups of four. And Every single time we do this, there's one girl who realizes that someone has to draw all of the stuff that goes into an app. Somebody had to generate all of the art that you see. And someone realizes that uh, breaking stuff is really fun. Like I, the best thing in the world to do is to push that button and push back when you're not supposed to push back. And what happens if you hit the home button in the middle? And how does all, how does all of this work? And what, what happens when you do these things? And then... Um, someone else realizes that uh, getting up and talking about their app to other people is like the best thing they could have been doing. And all of these things, like showing people that there's more to developing software than just hunching over and typing mystery strings of characters into what looks like a terminal. Um, you know, there, there's so much more to it than that. And, and we don't necessarily expect that all of them are going to become computer scientists, but we do hear the same stories from all of them, which is things about... Um, 
things about how I went to this camp and I was the only girl. And so all of the boys shouted me down and none of my ideas made it into the project we were doing. Or, um, you know, I would, I tried to offer and, and, you know, none of the boys took me seriously because it was a computer thing and I'm female and that's not supposed to happen. And, you know, we, we kept hearing these stories over and over. And, and one of the great things about this year is that, um, we had volunteers they once they extended the WWDC scholarship program to STEM organizations, one of the organizations they extended it to was App Camp for Girls. And some of the people who volunteer for App Camp were people who got those scholarships. And it was really great to get to have the opportunity to have those people at Dub Dub actually learning, actually talking about that stuff. And uh, I really, I get so much more out of it. Like I know we're doing something that's really great for the girls that are there who get to learn a lot more about what it takes to make software development happen and what software development is all about. And yet at the same time, we get so much out of it to see their ideas. And when they didn't have to put up with all of this kind of stuff, you know, yep. nearly as long as, as all of the adults have, um, you know, they have so much enthusiasm for it and they're so great and super creative and just getting to have the, the, the week that we get to spend with them, um, every time like it's a completely different group of people and it's always so 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 much fun and so the indiegogo fundraiser that we're doing is to build this into a sustainable organization gene had an idea and we've proven it can work and we've proven that um it's something we can execute not just in a different location but in a different country we are officially a society of canada now so that we can start our eastward migration um so yeah we're, we're coming for you renee <laughs> can't wait you're not May you not die of cholera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I, 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 I love that. One of my ox. I mean, and so, but I, <laughs> it's, I love it so much. And, and I'm really excited that this went from an idea that Gene McDonald had to what it is today. And we're, what we're doing with this current fundraiser is trying to build an ongoing organization that will have the funding for things like staff members so that we have people for whom App Camp for Girls is their entire job. And, coordinating all of these things and being able to take the app camp kit and export it to anybody that wants to build one and making this a reality for as many people as want it to be a reality for them. And that's our ultimate goal. Um, and the joke I always tell people is that um, what I do to make sure that I can keep track of all my stuff because everybody's got the same white cable and everybody's got the same charger, you know, for their laptop and everything else, I put a Hello Kitty sticker on it. And it has 100% return rate for me. Uh, <laughs> nobody else ever wants my laptop adapter with the Hello Kitty sticker. And I want that to stop working. Yeah. Hmm. Well, again, I, every, every, time, every time I've met people who've been working with AppCam for Girls, it's just, every, they're all like you, which is a great thing to say about any organization. <laughs> uh, and I just, uh, I, I've, I've had uh, only a few experiences to teach in environments like that, not necessarily uh, uh, just for girls, but for all kids. But if there's anything that sort of brushes aside, any cynicism that has sort of crept in after 10 years or 20 years of observing technology or working in technology and running apps, it's being the person who shows someone the first, uh, their first app dev kit and watching them as they discover that they have a power that they did not have uh, before they got out, out of the car this morning. Uh, so uh, just really great organization, and I'm so glad we had a chance to talk about it. Uh, before we go, though, of course, Apple tried to befuddle us by coming out with a big <laughs> announcement just <laughs> after we normally stop uh, recording, but we stuck it to them. Didn't we stuck, stick it to them, Renee? Renee, tell us what Apple tried to get us to not be able to talk about today. So, yeah, so pushing out software is hard. GarageBand 10.1 for OS X just got updated, and it brings the funk, Andy. It brings the electronic dance music, the hip-hop. It <laughs> bring the noise as well, though. <laughs> it does, we, we, got, we, got the, we got the funk. Do We got the Base, noise as well. how low can you go? Um, yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> it, uh, it, it has all, for everyone who's loved the acoustic stuff and the sort of stuff that's been in GarageBand before, they've now added all the synthesizers, and they've added all the beats and everything that you could want to use to produce sort of the electronic, the hip-hop, that sort of sound. It's got this awesome pad that you can use 
use to sort of move things around. And you can record stuff now. They brought the record level feature down from the Pro Set to the, the free Garage Band set. And it's just, I only had a really brief time to look at it. But, I mean, there's house, there's techno, there's dubstep. Uh, and I think it's really awesome that kids who are, not just kids, but everybody who's listening to this kind of music can now go to GarageBand and have it sort of easily accessible to them so they can go from enjoying it to sort of making it. And the barrier for entry into GarageBand has always been extremely low. And they've got a really good way of rewarding you. They kind of do all the heavy lifting so that you don't have to worry about how to how to get started. You don't have to feel like a failure and stop as soon as you get started. And they brought all of that to the new sort of techno electronic sound that they're they're adding to this feature set now. So there's a ton of stuff inside there. There's 10 new drums. There's 100 new loops. Again, it's all of Apple's music director people involved. So it's super high quality. It sounds great. Uh, it's really easy to use. If you're at all interested in this kind of stuff, absolutely check it out. Uh, great. So we did, we did manage... We did manage to get it in GarageBand. Still, one of the, the the adult version of the Busy Box we played with as little kids, with the yes. with the added <laughs> event that you can actually create art with it. But who who am I kidding? I'm just using it to mm. use the drum and machine. The connect stuff, like Christina things. mentioned in the iOS version, it will be coming to the OS 10 version in a future update. Not there this time. Super. Um, yeah. I guess that, I guess that's going to be it for us this week. Uh, Kelly Gamon, thanks for joining us this week. Uh, where can people read you or see you this week? Uh, you can find me over at MacObserver.com. I'm sometimes also on the Daily Observation podcast. I host a show with Mike Rose called The After Show, which is also a fun one. And you can read my stuff over at MacObserver.com. Super. Christina, uh, I'm sure you're going to have a lot more stuff to write about uh, Apple Music. I, I fear for your fingers and your keyboard. Uh, when's that <laughs> stuff going to be hitting yeah, no. So I've got a full review that I've got in the works and that hopefully that, that, that'll be up by, by Thursday. Um, with any luck, maybe midday tomorrow. Um, we'll see. I'm, I'm still like sleepy. So um, <laughs> and, and we've got to actually wait for the iTunes uh, release to finally come out to you. So um, uh, you got to give them some time. But uh, but until then, um, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at film underscore girl. Uh, you can read all of my work on Mashable. Um, I co-host uh, Tech News Today on Fridays, and I host two podcasts or co-host two podcasts. One is called Overtired with Brett Terpstra. It's uh, from, uh, from Objective C to the OC, from Swift to Taylor Swift, two nerds kind of geeking out over, over tech and life. And I co-host Rocket, um, Accelerated Geek Conversation with Simone de Rochefort and uh, Burana Wu, which is kind of a, a female perspective on uh, the Typical Tech Podcast. And Renee, uh, uh, congratulations, by the way. Uh, Serenity Caldwell had a really great fact on uh, Apple Music. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to really talk about that during the show. Uh, but this and all, what other cool things are up on iMore this week? Oh, uh, it's the the same stuff. I mean, they, the Apple Music is just going to consume huge portions of it. We're still trying to digest iOS 9 and, and LCAP 10. So you can keep it locked to iMore. And for as long as we can survive, we will keep putting stuff up there. So long as you keep paying for the domain and auto renews, there will be all kinds of abundance of joys oh, and for commentaries to be for there. <laughs> <laughs> I go like, pause for a second. I got to go pick a transaction. Nobody poach that. <laughs> <laughs> and Renee's actually going, uh, uh, Leo's going to be out for another two weeks on vacation. Renee's going to be hosting uh, next week. So Alvorn has that to look forward to. Uh, but for now, I am your host and master, Andy Anatko, thanking you for listening this week. Looking forward to having you listen to us next week. Until then, get back to work. Brick time is over. Go, Bricks. 